Good afternoon. Uh, it is Thursday, November 16th. This is a uh, joint committee meeting uh, with education and culture, public safety, economic development, and health and human services. So it's really important. Um, and uh, we're here to discuss two items on workforce development in our public safety careers and in our health and human services careers. I'm Chair Will Jawando. I'm joined by of the Education Committee. I'm joined by Chair Albernaz, Chair Fani Gonzalez, and Chair Sidney Katz, and uh, my other fellow council members from the various committees. Um, and we're excited to dive in. Uh, I know all of us, I'll just say briefly so we can get into it, understand the importance of making sure all of our public sector officials, but particularly in these areas, uh, that we have a good pipeline that we're developing. They're so critical to the service of our residents, uh, and we have so many that are serving right now, and I really appreciate everyone showing up. Um, and so we want to really talk about what we are doing to make sure that we have a pipeline uh, as people get ready to retire. I'm not giving you any ideas. Don't retire tomorrow. Um, but that we know that will happen, um, and we want to make sure that we are filling current vacancies and creating pathways for future folks that want to serve in government service, uh, which is really needed right now. So uh, with that, I'll turn to my uh, co-chairs, uh, Councilmember Albanaz and Fanny Gonzalez, and Councilmember Katz, if he would like to. Okay, uh, I'll just be very brief. That was well said, and we so appreciate the dedication and commitment of our first responders, and particularly those that are working in the field of health. Um, we know the last four years have been exponentially difficult, and we're still feeling the effects of that in every way imaginable. And so it, we, we have to have an all-hands-on-deck approach. Um, this council is committed to doing what it can, whether it be by providing resources, whether it be by passing legislation, but also just issuing words of encouragement and thanks whenever we can, wherever we can, uh, because we can never give enough thanks. So with that, I yield to my colleague uh, and chair, Fanny Gonzalez. Uh, good afternoon. I spent, a couple of days ago, I spent the evening almost until midnight with uh, Wheaton Volunteer Rescue Squad, and I got on the ambulance, and I saw all their amazing work, and it, it was exciting to see them in action, but also not because they were so effective, but because they did their work with so much kindness. I mean, dealing with uh, communities that are are you know struggling and in this case there was, was a lady that was um very sick and um you guys do really tough work and i all i did was showing up and and ride on the ambulance and the fire truck and bring lasagna i got them a lot of lasagna uh i i yeah and they, they asked me to go back very often i think it's because of the food but anyway uh thank you for for all you do, and I look forward to an exciting uh, work session. I pass it now to uh, Chair Katz. Thank you very much. The reason I'm over here is because I <clears throat> sound like Oscar the Grouch. Uh, the the um, it, somehow I really don't have a feel badly except I'm dragging, but except for uh, it all settled in my throat. And I mentioned that one of the times that I got a standing ovation, the only time I ever got a standing ovation in high school is when I, were, I was at an assembly and they announced that I had laryngitis the entire school. So <clears throat> please, no standing ovations. To, now you can if you want. Um, as we go through this, do you want me to go through the, the public safety? How are we doing this? If, if you're able and you'd yeah, like I, to, I'll absolutely. Try. Not, you'll jump in. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, first off, as we go through this, I want to thank Ms. Farad for doing the packet. And and um, I think this is the first time that I can ever remember we've had four committees working together. But if this doesn't show that it takes a village to have public safety, I don't know what does. And it, and it we are proving it time and time again. Um, we have discussed many times at full council and at public safety uh, committee, many times the challenges uh, in recruitment and retaining first responders. And, and, uh, and that's not to say that the other departments who are also present here um, don't have problems as well. They do. But ours, the public safety side, seems to be the, one of the most unique, and that's, um, and that's because 
of the, the nature of the work. For many, many years, Montgomery County had had um, had people who, who it was the family business. They were they uh, had been in public safety. They had been firefighters or or police officers in many cases, and and their children followed them in that line of work. We're not getting that as much anymore. Thank goodness we're still getting some, but we're not getting that as much. And it's become more and more difficult to recruit and to retain. Um, in in the packet itself, I'm going to ask Ms. Farag to lead us through, but in the packet itself, uh, she's brought up many things that perhaps we should be considering and discussing further. We need to keep in mind that our labor partners uh, need to be a great part of this discussion and keep in mind that there are those areas that might need to be collectively bargained, and we certainly uh, uh, want to have that happen. We are very fortunate to have so many people in Montgomery County uh, uh, be in the fire service, both career and volunteer, as well as police and corrections and sheriffs and dispatchers, and the list goes on. The second part of today's discussion once again reminds us how combined all of our areas are to deal with public safety, and that's with the Department of Health and Human Services side. So if we, once again, we're proving that it takes a village to create a better village, and that's what we're doing today, and if it meets with your approval, I'm going to ask Ms. Farag to please lead us through this packet. Good afternoon. I'm just going to um, go off of what Chair Katz had mentioned about this. Um, today we have representatives from the fire department and the police department here, but there are also um, individuals from MCPS and Montgomery College in case you have any questions about those educational programs that we're about to talk about. But in general, um, the workforce is changing. Gen Z is looking for very different things than what maybe somebody my age might have looked for. Um, and they're not looking, they're not really envisioning staying in one place 35, 40 years anymore. And they have very different um, and very clear expectations of what they want in a workplace. Um, and we've seen this a lot in the public sector. The public sector has been hit much more hard than um, private sector has been after COVID. And, um, we also have the complementary goal of diversifying the workforce to make it look much more representative of Montgomery County and the people that government serves. And so several of these programs that um, the departments will talk about today are reaching into the high schools and the colleges locally and helping kids and young adults get more um, a more realistic idea of what this work really entails. And Chair Katz had mentioned how a lot of it is basically a family affair for generation after generation, which is fantastic. But there are a lot of kids out there whose families have never done this work and who may have an interest. And this is a better way to be able to reach some of those kids who had never thought of being possibly a firefighter or a paramedic or a police officer. Um, so um, as we work together for these different types of programs, today to see these complementary goals of getting kids interested in this work, but also getting local kids interested in this work. So I'm going to turn it over to FIRE. Um, they do have two PowerPoints, which I will, they'll walk us through. And just before we do that, I'll just ask colleagues, we'll to do the presentations, then do questions. I think, yeah, I think it'd be better. Okay, thank you. So hi, I'm Interim Chief, Fire Chief John Kinsley. Um, as a way of opening remarks, I just wanted to introduce staff. Um, I've been blessed and surrounded by really good people. So presenting today will be our training academy chief, Ms. Beth Sanford, and our volunteer services division chief, Mike Kelly. Um, but I also wanted to take this moment to um, embarrass somebody, my executive officer, <laughs> Dee Richards. She's just been promoted to division chief. All right. And uh, she'll be taking over my old job as the HR division chief. Wow. Well, so, congratulations. Um, so we're ready to present. Um, we'll just we'll start with uh, Chief Sanford. Hi. Uh, again, I'm Chief Beth Sanford of the Academy. Uh, I've seen many of you either at graduation or fire ops or, you know, one of those functions that's always, you know, got a lot of positivity associated with it. So something else that's got some positivity associated with it is the high school cadet program. Uh, right now, obviously, we're in the uh, academic year of 23-24. And this is the first year since COVID that we're running both fire and EMS. So you can go ahead. Uh, 
the high school cadet program in its entirety is a two-year program uh, that the obviously starts in the, well not obviously it, it, they start in, in their junior year if they want to to participate uh, not before then so we have juniors and seniors uh, that are in the program currently we have 39 students uh, 18 are in the fire side of the program 21 are in EMS uh, the the 21 in EMS uh, those are all seniors they will not get the fire program and I can explain that later if you have questions as to why they're not getting the fire program. Uh, and then we've got 18 that are, uh, most of them are juniors. They'll have a chance to take EMT next year. We do have a couple of seniors that are in the firefighting program. But it's a two year in the MCPS language, they call it a completer program. They're gonna end with a, uh, when they, if they successfully complete everything, they are nationally certified EMTs. They're Maryland certified firefighters. They have hazmat operations. And um, they're, you know, that's going to uh, get them, you know, with a few extra little small additives, um, able to ride on fire apparatus and ambulances in Montgomery County. Um, we're, we, we're proud of the program. We like having the kids there. Um, and let's go to the next one. So there, there you have it on the slide. Um, they'll be nationally and Maryland certified as EMTs. Uh, they'll have uh, PPE is the, the language that we use. Personal protective equipment is not it is partly the, the clothes that they wear when they're out at an incident, uh, a fire incident. It's also the breathing apparatus and so forth. We train them in hazardous materials operations, and then we train them through Fire One uh, to Fire Two um, in those programs. And the way we train them is exactly the same way we train everybody else. Um, the only difference is it takes a lot longer to get there because the kids are only with us at the training academy during the middle of the school day. Um, they go to their home schools in the morning, they hop on a bus, the bus brings them to us, uh, and then they spend the second half of their day with us at the academy. So it's just the, the pace is a little bit slower um, in terms of how we can progress through the program. This year we have 17 of the 25 high schools represented um, and the, that's a list of the high schools that are represented um, and the but you know bus service is good that's all taken care of the kids can drive if they want to but they come to us for about three hours during the middle of the day um, we can go to the next one one of the things that I think all of us uh, feel positive about is it's a it's a really fun and diverse group of kids um, there are, uh, there's a good, when we talk about diversity in fire rescue, um, it, you have to throw women in there, right? Uh, you know, D and I are, I don't know, we're kind of anomalies. <laughs> um, not completely, but at any rate, there's a lot of gals in the, in the high school program that are participating, doing great. Um, and the high schools in general, like they're great, rep they are representative of, of the county, right? And there's a lot of diversity there. Um, so I think that's a great way and a great um, a built in um, positive for us. Um, we have, uh, let's see, I'm sorry about the 20, oh sorry, that's only for last year. We had 20 students last year. So last year was the first year we, we ran the program since COVID um, and we were it, it was a little too heavy of a lift to get uh, fire and EMS off the ground it, last year. So we just started with EMS. Uh, and so that was last academic year, six juniors, 14 seniors. Uh, 13 of them were able to get their national registry um, EMS certification. Five are, are in the retest process and two were ineligible. I can answer questions about that later if you wish. Um, and then four more, like we mentioned earlier, have gone on to uh, the fire program this year that uh, were juniors last year. So over the years, uh, this is these are recent numbers since, since COVID. Uh, we have four cadets that have been hired as career recruits in our fire rescue as a career employee. Uh, one female, one Hispanic, two black, kids uh two of those four are 
finishing up their probation. They were actually at the academy this morning for probationary testing. Uh, and they were part of the high school cadet program, sorry, before COVID. Um, we have three more that are in the hiring process now and two that are, the three that are in the hiring process for the class that starts in January. And then we have two more that are in the process for the class that will start in July of 24. So community involvement wise, um, there's one of the things that's fun about the high school cadet program uh, are that the, the kids can, can volunteer if they wish at any of the LFRD stations. All of the LFRDs have junior member programs that allow uh, minors at 16, 17 years old to be a part of their program. Uh, we found that we've got a lot of uh, parents in uh, parents of the kids in the schools. Uh, last year, we had a couple parents who were physicians that came in and gave lectures in the EMT class, which was awesome. Um, which, as everybody knows, right, it's good to have like a fresh voice. And when you hear the same voice every single day, all day, so and how fun is it to have your parent come in and you know and share some stuff, right? Uh, that that's real live stuff. And and now's a good time, right, to kind of. Uh, share one of the things that is, um, you know, about this program. I started to say it earlier. It is the program. The kids in high school are, they're going to run calls, right? And we, we try to do a really good job in orientation of making sure the parents understand. We can't filter which calls are going to, who's going to call 911, right? So your child may be on an ambulance or a fire engine uh, on an incident that is, is very severe. And we want the kids to understand that uh, we know that they are minor children. At the same time, we're asking them to have an emotional intelligence quotient that, that matches what we need them to be able to do. Um, and they, without fail, they meet that um, really very, very well. Um, so that it, it hasn't been a problem at all. Um, in fact, it's, it's actually a blessing. And sometimes, you know, sometimes the kids have a thing or two to show the rest of us jaded folks. <laughs> Do we have another one? So, you know, going, <laughs> the, this slide is just, it's a good one, right? I mean, it, it, it gives me goosebumps almost. Uh, the instructors that we've had teaching the programs, uh, they're just, they're our career um, employees that are, are trained and have the official certifications required to teach EMT and fire. Uh, and, and they're also just really great human beings. Uh, for example, um, there was a young lady last year in the EMT class who her attendance was perfect and then all of a sudden she was gone for a couple days and the instructors, you know, recognizing that something was wrong, they tried to call the parent, they tried to reach the child, um, and they were finally able to reach her and she told them, look, I've been babysitting my toddler, small brother or sister, because we are getting evicted from our apartment. And, you know, my mom is trying desperately to find a place for us to live. And I have to stay home with this kid, uh, with a sibling. And these guys, uh, one of them who before he came to fire rescue worked for the county, I don't know, I don't re recall exactly doing what, but he worked at the up county center at Middlebrook. Uh, he knew that there was a housing office there. So those two guys, after work, got in their car, they drove up to the housing office, and they said, I don't know what, but is there anything we can do to help them? And the housing office said, yes, there is, and did what, you know, they know what to do to help. And, you know, we're able to get this family actually to, to be able to stay in their, in their apartment uh, and help them bridge, you know, the, the circumstances that they were in. But, I, you know, it's just, there's just a lot of really positive human things that are happening in this program. And we all know, right, nobody, Beth Sanford's in charge of the training academy. I didn't even know what had happened until somebody else told me about those guys, right? And so there's just a lot of uh, good personal interaction. It's a great opportunity for the kids to, um, to mature and grow in, in an adult environment. Uh, and then it's also a great opportunity for us um, what are what are we missing? Well, uh, we need a much bigger training academy. Uh, Captain Clark, he'll tell you the same thing here in a minute. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, we need a much bigger training academy. We're really, really tight on space. Um, we were tight on space before we started running the high school cadet program. Uh, we have a, a calendar that we share with the police where we, we track uh, classrooms and outdoor space and so forth. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a genuine issue. Um, we're, we're constantly kind of internally, you know, duking things out with each other and so forth to get a room, um, in both inside and outside, um, because obviously what we do is outdoor skills heavy um, work. Uh, and then our instructor, um, our, our cache of instructors, uh, it takes a lot of instructor support to run these classes. We also have a recruit class going on at the same time. So we're drawing from the same, um, uh, same group of people who are certified instructors. We're, um, and that's a limited pool. We're growing the pool, uh, but it, it to become a Maryland certified fire rescue instructor is there's a quite a few ho hoops to jump through. It's not as bad as being an MCPS teacher, um, but there are quite a few hoops that are required for for folks to to engage in before they become certified. So it's a it's a pretty heavy lift for us um, space wise, instructor um, management wise. Uh, so you know those those are our two biggest um, obstacles. Uh, all those, all the rest were 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 really good at overcoming. Um, you know, I think just in summary here, uh, the 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 population in the cadet program is a great representative of, of the county as a whole. Um, I everybody in the room will feel really proud about that. Um, in what capacity can they go on to fill future vacancies within fire rescue? Uh, there is a lot of potential for that to happen as it stands right now. Uh, back on the slide, a couple of slides ago, we talked about four that had been hired. We don't currently have a, uh, a way of um, hiring them as employees directly out on the street and ready to go. Uh, that's something we're talking about and we're working on. We don't have that in place as it stands. We would have to do things like um, introduce a new job class in the, in, within class and comp and so forth um, because well, the details don't matter. Um, so there would be a lot of work to do in order to make that happen, but we're giving them what they need. Um, probably, you know, it would take a little bit to orient them to be county employees, but as far as the training goes, we're giving them what they need to be ready to go, checked off folks, ready to ride the units, um, you know, with, with a few deficiencies, but easy to, easy to um, fill in those gaps. So, you know, that's something that we really need, you know, I think to look at. Uh, we're pouring a lot of time and energy and finances into this program, and um, it would be great to keep these kids here in the county um, in their own communities, uh, you know, able to engage with, with folks that, that are part of their community um, and keep them here and keep them involved. And, uh, you know, I think it's a win-win it's a and very positive experience. Thank you. Uh, do you have a uh, something a presentation as well? And, and our police colleagues, why don't you? We're going to go they're, to you next. So. Yeah, they're in the next. Yeah. Yeah, I do have a few slides to, okay, to great. go through. Uh, again, I'm Michael Kelly. I'm the division chief of volunteer services. Um, while that's being set up, we have, uh, as I think you know, we have uh, 19 volunteer fire departments in the county that provide um, some kind, some level of volunteer opportunities. Uh, 18 of those have actual. Um, firefighter and EMT opportunities too. And they range from a large department with four stations like Rockville, and Kensington, and to a single station departments um, like the re two rescue squads we have and then Germantown and some other places. Um, so um, we are now about 40%, um, 60%, 40% 40 female, 60% male. Um, and you can see the, uh, um, the, the breakdown uh, by, of diversity. The large number of unknown, um, that's basically, um, I'll call them like life members, retired members, mostly administrative members that are not as active anymore. And when the, when the database was set up in 2007, um, um, those were people we didn't um, uh, detail the race up until then. But, but um, if you look at the Percentages above that, it's about 22%. Um, next slide. Now, this is the uh, breakdown of training that goes on um, in the fire stations um, on a 
day-to-day -day basis. And this is the first quarter of FY24 and all the different categories of training that take place. Um, each department has their own um, uh, probationary manual, their own training manual, so the, the different avenues they take toward promotion uh, vary from uh, department to department. What I don't have is the number of um, training hours at the training academy. But the best measure of that is um, almost all of the departments, since we require EMT to be the basic level of training to provide day-to-day um, -day frontline service, um, we put out about 75 new volunteer EMTs every year. Um, I have a three-year total of uh, 226 total, about 75 a year. I only went back three years because during the COVID years, there was basically no formal training at the academy, so we didn't want to include those particular years. Next slide, please. And this is the same breakdown of the previous slide by fire department uh, and rescue squad. So you can see the larger departments um, have some of the, um, have most of the members, more members, do most of the training. Now, um, even though this is the first quarter, they have until the end of December to get their numbers in, so they could be slightly higher. But uh, uh, 2,700 hours per quarter is a, is a pretty good number. And this is a list of the courses that are offered at the training academy. Um, the, um, the, again, the avenue that the um, local department requires their members to take or give them the option to take generally all start with EMT, but there are a handful, say five or six core orientation courses that also have to be taken that are included in here. And, um, and this here is the last five years of hiring of volunteers. Not only do they provide key frontline service at the LFRDs, but they also provide a well-trained pool of individuals that can be hired by the county. So that's an average of about 12 a year. Uh, be higher if you did not count the COVID year where I guess we just didn't have um, as a class or just maybe one class. And there are um, some years where I guess we have more than two that might graduate. But uh, at any rate, um, we do a, a good job of providing trained and they're the most active ones at the stations also. So I think that is it for me. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I'll, I'll just have a very few questions here. But first off, thank you all for all the first responders and everyone else for everything you're doing for us. If someone goes through the cadet program, do they have to then go back through the academy? As it stands right now, yes, sir, they do. Is there a way that that could be? I mean, if you're getting the same course, as a cadet, I mean, you, you want everybody to be trained to the, you know, the nth degree. But if they're getting the same course, are we, are we hurting ourselves by making them go back through that the academy? Uh, I would not say we're hurting okay, ourselves. You, I, I said um, it wrong. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, but but yeah, they're they're they are having to go through twice right now as it stands. That's you know as we were mentioning earlier, we would you know to for us to be able to create a pathway for them to be able to be hired. Uh, is is something we absolutely you know need to to dig into. Would that be a legislative change from the county, or is that does that go through the state? So, it, um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things we would have probably have to do would be to create a new job class. Uh, the current job class requirement for firefighter rescuer requires you to have a non provisional driver's license. I can't put them through ev emergency vehicle operator course without that um, and most of the kids in high school the earliest if you're if you're a gung-ho kid that wants to drive the very earliest minute you can have a non-provisional license is when you're 18 years old if you wait for a little while and you don't get your learner's permit till later or if you have a, a traffic uh, violation they generally will extend your provisional status uh, until you know you've been able to prove yourself so uh, the job class requirement, uh, and that's part of the EVOC, the emergency vehicle operator, I can't train them to be drivers when they have a non-provisional license. So we've got to overcome that. So whether we create another job class that yep. allows them to come in without that and perform duties that don't relate to driving, those are things that we're working through right now. 
If you could keep us informed on that, I, I, I think all of us would be interested in helping. If the same thing for the volunteers. If a volunteer goes through the, the training, do they have to go back if, and the, decide to become a career firefighter? Do they have to go back through the academy as well? Uh, so what we try to do is, uh, in the past we've done this, we have, we call it informally a pop-out class, which is a much shortened, normally recruit school is 26 weeks long. Uh, if you come in with nothing, it's an entry-level position, you, as you all know. Uh, when we do a pop-out class, all the people come to us with Fire 1, Fire 2, <coughs> Hazmat Operations, and EMT. And then we give them EVOC, Emergency Vehicle Operator. We give them safety, uh, safety, firefighter safety and survival, and we give them a few other um, uh, county-focused uh, classes. So a uh, pop-out class, a pop-out class for the high school cadets really could be eh, about a month, probably. So in other words, if they graduated high school in June, uh, we can put them through pop-out in the summer and have them ready to go, you know, pretty quickly if we can you know, talk through how we're going to, you know, get through some of these other uh, components. Please, go ahead, please, Chief. If I can add, the last time we did a pop-out class was just prior to COVID. Um, council approved, I believe it was 20 extra positions um, so that we could help reduce overtime. And so we focused on hiring folks that were previously trained, and we put them through that truncated class in order to get them on the streets as soon as possible and help us reduce the overtime. So we have done it in the past, and it's still something that we consider an option. Um, through our normal recruitment process, though, we're not getting enough individuals who have been previously trained um, to make it worthwhile running them through a pop-out. It's just easier to throw the two or three with training into the whole class. But it is something we want to consider in the future. Thank you. Please keep us informed. And I turn back to you, Mr. Yeah. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we're going to actually ask MCPD to come down and do their, if there's a presentation, and then we will, because there's a super majority of colleagues here, then we can, if I can ask our fire colleagues to stay, and then we'll ask questions about, there's obviously overlap. So we let the uh, laryngitis uh, chair go, <laughs> go, go, a, go, a little, go a little first there. But. Thank you. <laughs> On behalf of all of us, no voice. I had to get you back. Yeah, yeah, you did. You, I deserve it. <laughs> This is Chief Frankie. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you, Council Member. My name is Darren Frank. I'm the Assistant Chief of the Management Services Bureau for Montgomery County Police. Uh, today with me is Captain Ian Clark. He is the Director of our Academy uh, Training and Education Division and my Executive Officer, Lieutenant Dan Helton. So first off, I want to thank Council Members and those that aren't here for all of the efforts you have put in to help us with what is a profound problem. Attrition, uh, attrition has, and hiring together have left us right now 158 officers short. Uh, and, and for a department our size it, that is run lean for many years, that is a very big problem. It means reduction in services, potentially. It means slower responses, although I will, I, I have to commend both our communications division, who maintain uh, terrific rates of answering calls, and to our officers that despite the vacancies, they continue to meet our expectations for getting to, to violent crimes, to getting to critical scenes, and rendering aid just like our fire rescue partners. So this is this conversation is part of the bigger picture, and, and we do really appreciate having it because we are not leaving any stone unturned at this point to try and find uh, p future police officers and future uh, emergency communication specialists. The, these programs today, uh, we're going to give you an overview of. Uh, Captain Clark uh, heads up these efforts with our Police Explorer program, our cadet program, and also our, our high school uh, career program. So he's going to give you an introduction on those courses briefly, what we do, what we uh, expect of our folks. And then we're going to come around at the end, and, and both he and I are going to, going to kind of express the challenges and where we'd like to go with these programs. Because they're incredibly valuable to what we do, especially when you look at the fact that we want Montgomery County residents, we want Montgomery County children to come and serve in their community and stay here. 
and it is a rewarding career. And uh, again, going back to the council and the county executive's office, over the last couple of years, a tremendous effort has been put into making it more attractive between hiring bonuses, between salaries, between adjustments in, in retirements. It is a very rewarding career, uh, both it can be financially, but in addition to that, being able to uh, go and render aid to an individual and save their lives, go to a family, maybe disrupt the cycle of violence. I mean, there's nothing more rewarding. At least that's one of the things that I have found in my career. And the same with fire rescue, you know, going and taking care of someone that's in critical life, need of life-saving efforts. It's, it's, it's very profound that people can do that. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to have Captain Clark give you an in introduction to the programs, and then we'll, and then we'll uh, conclude our presentation. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for, for having us. Appreciate being here. So I want to talk first about our, our partnership with uh, MCPS. We have a, a law enforcement leadership program um, between uh, Edison High School and Seneca Valley High School. Um, I was just uh, talking with uh, Sean Krasa, who's uh, the, the uh, supervisor uh, from MCPS. Just yesterday we were talking, we were talking this morning too. Currently there are 113 MCPS students between both programs where they get receive law enforcement specific uh, training and education. Can I just ask you, just move the mic a little bit towards you there. Yeah. Yeah. You said 113. 113. Okay. Yes, yeah. sir. Um, and with that, um, there's some like cross pollination with our Explorer program, where we have some explorers uh, who are also part of the law enforcement and leadership program between those schools. Currently, our Explorer program, we have 28 explorers, which is is the most that uh, I, I remember. Um, and uh, to be eligible, we have to be between the ages of 14 and 20. Uh, maintain a minimum GPA 2.0 and live in Montgomery County or uh, go to school in Montgomery County. What's interesting is we talk about um, how we want public safety to reflect our community. So we have um, nine Hispanic males and nine uh, Hispanic females, three African American males, one African American female, three Asian males and uh, one Asian female, and one white male and uh, one white female. Um, it's really, and these are all um, students um, from Montgomery County. Uh, it, it's a really neat program where um, they meet once a week. And when we talk about diversity, it's um, there's a couple of uh, the explorers that don't don't speak English or have limited English, and some of the senior explorers have stepped up and translated in Spanish for them, so they get the full experience. So we're really proud of that program. Um, and then with that, uh, we also have our cadet program, which is run uh, differently than fire rescue. Our, our cadet program eligibility is you have to be a college student, uh, maintain a minimum of 2.0, um, and you are eligible for that program for, for up to two years. Um, with, with that program, we have nine of our 15, and we did have 17, but one just got hired and one is in the hiring process. But we have nine from Montgomery College, four from the University of Maryland, one from Frederick Community, and one from GW. Again, uh, reflection of our, our community, we have four Hispanic males, four Hispanic females, one African-American male, two Asian males, two um, Asian females, uh, three white males, and one white female. Again, this is just an organic reflection of our community. Um, with that, we um, have also partnered with uh, Montgomery College, not just our capstone project, which uh, we will be uh, doing again in January, um, but with the cadet program where um, our cadets uh, last year, uh, school year 2022-2023, participated in, in the uh, Montgomery College Humanity Days, uh, discussing policing um, and uh, community connections, both on Zoom one day and in person in the Tacoma Park um, Silver Spring uh, campus. Other activities that our cadets uh, participate in um, include uh, the recent Montgomery Goes Purple, a Public Safety Appreciation Day, Bring a Child to Work Day, uh, they are part of the Maryland Lynching Project, the 5th District Open House, Burtonsville Fire Station. So besides working with our agency and, and learning about law enforcement, they're participating in the community and the community activities, um, supporting all of us. With that, um, there are challenges to our cadet program. Um, a couple years ago, uh, the council authorized 25 positions for our cadet program. We have 15. Uh, we have not been able to fill the 25. And the way we run it to give the most eligibility to people is we start a class in August and January. 
very similar to a, um, a, uh, a recruit a recruit cycle. And the reason we do that is to work with the students before they get their schedules so we can work with them so um, they can attend all the classes they need and then they can um, come work for our department. They work 20 hours a week, um, August through May. So they get their summers off, but this also produces a challenge that, that um, Chief Frank is gonna, gonna discuss. So that's a little bit about our programs and we can go into more details, but we do wanna talk about where we're going uh, and, and certainly the benefit. I did want to highlight, I know uh, I'm not as good at math as, as Captain Clark is, but when you look at the diversity and the reflection of our community that these programs have, uh, you all know that we're part of the 30 by 30 initiative. So right now in our cadet program, 41% of our, of our uh, attendees are, are uh, women. Uh, for our Explorer program, 42%, 43% actually. And then when you look at the overall diversity, our Explorers, 93% diversity. Uh, only 7% of them are white males. So it really reflects our community. Uh, actually, it goes beyond reflecting our community, to be quite honest. And it, be, it allows us to bring perspective in, into our department, not only from those backgrounds, but from being residents in Montgomery County. So incredibly valuable. But as uh, Captain Clark said, we have challenges. One of the things that we are finding, and he mentioned the inability to fill the cadet program. Part of that, there's, there's two things at play there. Number one, the competitive market that we're in. Uh, the fact is Starbucks, Target, places like that are paying more and offering benefits. So in addition to that, so with that, they're offering benefits. Now our cadet program used to have benefits. A determination was made that changed that and took away those benefits. So we've approached the county executive about restoring them because as all things came crashing in in these last few years, we have found that that is much more problematic than we thought, especially in such a competitive uh, employment area. So we're looking to restore those benefits. We're also looking to increase the hours for the cadet program through, our, through the budget process. We'd like to expand the cadet program, expand their pay, expand the program altogether. Uh, but that, that's a start. The other problem that we have with filling is a character problem. And not in the, not in the sense that, that we don't have good people applying, in the sense that there are things that, quite honestly, you can't be a part of and you can't have done as a juvenile, as a young adult, and be a police officer. It's what our community expects. It's what good practice shows we can't accept. And I'm not talking about marijuana or anything like that talking about more things. I'm talking about uh, integrity issues. So when we go through the background process, we discover these things and it really limits when we have people interested, they go through the background progress uh, process and we discover these problems. And so where does, where does that happen? Where does, where does that understanding of the incredible need of integrity to be a career law enforcement professional, where does that start? We believe it starts in high school. And so when we talk about where we want to go, we definitely want to increase our footprints in our high schools and our middle schools, to be honest, where we can talk more about uh, the integrity that it takes. And, and, and it goes beyond just being a police officer, a good citizen, right? and really drive home for those that show an interest from the early age what it takes to be uh, at, the top of, at the top of the list to get hired, at the top of the list to be a part of this profession. And we want to be able to reinforce that. I, 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 am, I do want to say we have Dr. Eric Benjamin here from Montgomery College. We also have Sean Crosser here from MCPS, and they're great partners. They just came today to support us and, and, and uh, hear what we have to say. And so we, uh, going back to the high school program that we have, it's isolated to, in some degrees, it's isolated to Einstein and Seneca Valley. There are some opportunities to, for people in other schools, but quite honestly, other schools don't hear the advertisements. So we want to grow upon that because if we can get them into uh, Sean's program and, and, and certainly support them expanding the program and talk about the integrity, the ethics, the talk about the service and things like that, it helps to drill 
into individuals what they have to do to be a part of the solution here in Montgomery County. Uh, because again, unfortunately, there are just some things we can't accept. Um, so we want to expand that uh, and, and get more involved. You know, another part of it, and, and I am very appreciative of the efforts to reestablish a presence of CEOs in schools, even just a little bit. When you talk to people that have, that have been Montgomery County residents and that have decided to come and be a part of this profession, many of them will point back to an SRO. I dealt with them when I was in high school and they were pretty cool. Or I saw them in uniform and it was, uh, it impressed me. Or they had whatever impact. This is a word of mouth profession. We have an opportunity to make really great impressions on people that, that put them towards uh, a life of service, just like you all when you go out in the community and touch people. People say, hey, I want to be a council member. The same thing with, uh, maybe they do, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, but uh, the, yeah, well, we're saying, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Edison, I apologize. I have, I have eased, my, my daughter wanted to go to a program at Einstein. I get it in my brain. Um, the, uh, so uh, getting back on, on to this, you know, being able to do that, and, and I will tell you, I believe you heard uh, the county executive speak about our hiring requirements. Uh, Chief Jones and I have had discussions with the county executive around hiring requirements and the requirement of a college education. Uh, I will tell you right now that uh, you know we do accept people without uh, a college requirement from the military, right? Military service, they've gone through uh, uh, basic training and they've been a part of the military and have an honorable record. But we're looking at now and, and really, this discussion, it's not forced, it's not been driven by attrition, although it's been accelerated by that. Uh, I know terrific people that haven't gone to college, that are have immense character, have uh, immense desire to serve their community. And are we doing a disservice by not giving them the opportunity? So what's the magic? What's the magic in that? And we're looking at that. And I think part of it, it has to do with number one, impressing upon young folks in high school that they can be a part of the Montgomery County Police, and and expanding our our presence there and our program there. I I, I just came from a training. I met a fellow from New Jersey, and at their trade school, they have an entire program for law enforcement, uh, because where they are, the requirement there isn't a college requirement, so they. They, they really start growing officers young and impressing upon them, again, best possible time uh, to grow that kind of dedication is in their youth. Uh, the, uh, so coming back around is, is, is on the discussion there, we do still believe that a college education is incredibly valuable. I have a college education, I learned some terrific things there. So we're looking at, is there a pathway where we can get you started get you into the department, maybe not necessarily with that 60 credits, but offer you a pathway to those 60 credits and beyond. And so we're exploring that. We're exploring our partnership with Montgomery College. I know Dr. Benjamin's ears perked up there a second ago. Um, but also the other universities in our area. Is there something that we can do with the support of uh, Montgomery County to offer opportunities for education and also offer the, offer the opportunity to serve. Uh, but again, a lot of it is driven by uh, character. The, uh, and, and there are some other problems, and I'm sure, uh, council members, you have questions, but those were the highlights of what we uh, wanted to talk about. And, and uh, certainly, we thank you again for the opportunity, and we're ready for questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, Chair Katz, do you want to kick us off? You're okay? Okay. Um, I, <laughs> I've scared him off now. I, um, if you change your mind, other colleagues, other colleagues text me. I'm going to go with the co-chairs first. I have a couple questions, and then I'll go to other colleagues uh, as you text. And Councilmember Luki, I think, is going to be the first one after the co-chairs. Um, thank you very much. This is really, really helpful and uh, important. And there's a lot here. So the good thing about having a big committee, I think we're going to divide and conquer. I think we'll be able to ask questions between all of us. So I'll just I'll just ask a couple. Um, 
uh, I wanted to mention, and it's not a shameless plug, but it is Summer Rise. Uh, I know of at least one or two students that did Summer Rise in the fire service that are now in the fire service. Uh, you know, they did the, the five weeks. Um, it, I, it's a, one of many potential on-ramp pathways into it. And I just would, would ask if, as the department, I have not heard about that in the police department, obviously a little different because you have the college requirement. But I think it's worth tracking. I have talked to many of my colleagues. You know, we're in our, it's in its seventh year. There's an oper the school systems here. We all agree we want a robust work-based learning experience for all of our, as many of our 50,000 high school students as possible. You know, and hopefully that number will continue to grow. We had over a thousand in summer rise this year. Could you talk about how that's interfacing with what you're doing, and do you see that as a potential area for growth? So uh, the summer rise program has been great. Uh, okay, and not say anything else. <laughs> okay. Good talk. <laughs> uh, so a, a couple things. One of the things that's that's really good is that um, I, I feel like now I'm the salesperson. It's you you get uh, a lot of bang for your buck, right? It's a relatively short program, but for us, it's pretty intensive, and we introduce those kids to a lot in that five-week period. Um, and it's a great opportunity for them to invest in something that might potentially be a career without uh, without the commitment to, to a two-year program in high school if they have other high school goals. Um, and, you know, I the, the high school cadet program is... Uh, it, it's an expensive program to run, um, and if you're not sure, the Summer Rise program is an awesome way to to introduce yourself uh, to to fire rescue. And the folks that have been running it are super enthusiastic. Um, the programs aren't are technically related in any way, except for the kids come from MCPS. Um, beyond that, they're not related, but it's a great program, and it's a really good way to introduce kids to what life in fire rescue might be like. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I'm hoping that during when you have them for those five weeks, you're talking about the cadet program. I don't know when you have to sign up to start. Do that. Does that line up? Because you, nope. it doesn't line nope. up, right? No, uh-uh. <laughs> yeah, because that, that, you have to decide to be a cadet when. Yeah, so the cadet program, they do their, their uh, Sean can, can speak to this better than I can, but uh, by February, they've already, um, right. we're already locking them into the next school year. Um, okay. so, so that doesn't line up. It does it, not line up as it stands right now. <laughs> okay, got it, got it. Uh, MCPD, anything on the, that front? So we're, we've got a note down here to look into that, but I will say we have other programs. Uh, one of the programs that's highly successful is the safety patrol program. Oh, yeah. So uh, as you all know, in, in, in uh, elementary, uh, elementary school, we, we get kids involved with uh, uh, our safety patrol, and, and they uh, come to, so not only through the course of the school year with working with the teachers, you know, they get the beginnings of the ethics that go with being safety patrol, but they also have a one-week camp that they go through. Uh, but certainly we can, as I said, we're looking for opportunities, and we're going to look into the Summer Rise program. We also have another uh, summer camp that we used to do in the in the first district, at, which, again, uh, it was all focused on introducing, introducing young people to law enforcement. We've had great success with that. So we're looking for those opportunities, and we're going to look at, some, at, at that program. Awesome. Thank you. And then I'll just ask one more question and then turn to my colleagues. Um, thank you, uh, Chief Frank, for the work in, with us, my office, and the, and the council, and Montgomery College, and the Community Informed Police Training Capstone Project. I was, it, it was great to speak to that group last year. I hope to do it again with the next class. Um, but one of the things, now that we have our governor that's launched this service year program, um, I, you guys have heard me mention many times, and I, I've shown you my ID. I, I did AmeriCorps mm -hmm. after high school, before college, and was placed with MCPD. Mm -hmm. That was a program that no longer exists, but that was a federal service program that you all had a relationship with in the 90s. Uh, they paid my salary, and I worked in the 3rd District. Um, to, and it allowed me to explore and meet some great lifelong mentors. Is this an opportunity, and this will be for the fire service too, have you talked with the county executive with the governor's office, and if not, what do you think? I think it could be a great opportunity to leverage uh, that program as it grows to place folks in public safety careers. Uh, have, has that come up at all? You just, you just turned it off. Yeah, thank you. 
Good Lord. So we've been looking at we've been looking at that internally, and and we're coming together with some thoughts upon it because we we haven't done it in a while, right? Uh, so we anything that benefits, well, especially if the state's supporting it, uh, would would be of great benefit for the continuation of it, and also for the for the for our other needs here. We can we can take advantage of that. So we're looking at it, and we're gonna and we're gonna make a recommendation. Okay, good. Well, that's good to hear. Fire service folks. Chief, or, yeah, it, yeah we're, we have not looked into it, but we will. Okay, great. Yeah, just I think it holds great opportunities. So that's the that's what I was hoping to hear that uh, you would. All right, I'll turn to Councilmember Albernas first. Uh, thank you very much. Um, appreciate the presentation. I know we got a lot of work to do, um, and it's going to take time. Uh, but we're all committed to making sure that we do everything we can. We had uh, passed last year a housing tax credit for first responders as. Another tool in the toolbox, this was through enabling legislation at the state level, um, recognizing the need for us to use every tool at our disposal uh, to provide financial incentives uh, and make it easier for first responders to be able to live in the communities that they serve. I know $2,500 in the grand scheme of things uh, is not far enough, but do we know how many people have utilized that program to date? I don't know, Ms. Farag, if you have that data, and we can get back to it if we don't have it. I would that have to disposal. get with another department to find that out. Okay. Um, because I think that's an example of, in addition to the salary increases, uh, the compensation increases, the cadet programs, the recruitment programs, I mean, we have to provide sort of tangible um, additional benefits um, that I think will be helpful. And even more so than just the financial benefit, further demonstrate that we're committed to appreciating and respecting these professions. Uh, and that they need to be supported and uplifted. Um, and in that vein, this was last year, but it was really interesting. Through a mutual friend, I was connected to a young man who was a sophomore at Montgomery College. And uh, he was uh, considering a career in law enforcement. And this kid was amazing. Um, and just exactly the kind of person that we would want in this important of a position. But he said, and it was a very candid conversation, what was holding him back was he had picked up on the tension between the council and in particular our police department. Uh, and in conversations that he was having with officers, they were telling him, uh, this isn't the place that it used to be. We're not receiving the support that we once had. And that was a very real and raw conversation. Um, because here was somebody who was on the fence considering joining our department, um, wondering if this body was committed to supporting him and our department. And I assured him that we are, and that we can and will do everything that we can uh, to make sure that we uplift and recognize and celebrate and honor the sacrifices of our officers in all of our first responder positions. We can do that and also ensure that we continue the longstanding tradition, both in fire and rescue and in our volunteer force and in MCPD to uphold the highest possible standards in our training, in our recruitment, and continue that legacy moving forward. We can do all these things at the same time. Um, it was about a half an hour conversation, and I'm happy to report that he has since uh, moved forward in his uh, law enforcement career and will be applying for an upcoming cadet class, uh, which I'm really excited about. But it just underscores that our rhetoric, our language as policymakers matters. And we have to make sure that we balance the way that we speak about these positions and always lead with the recognition of how important they are, particularly now. So. Um, I'm setting you up a little bit here, Assistant Chief Frank, but can you talk a little bit about, and we've talked about this before, and you've testified before this body before regarding the importance of that rhetoric, but could you just talk a little bit about that now? There are things that we can do, programs we can establish, but that doesn't cost any money. Um, so if you could just talk about the importance of that, and I would defer to my colleagues in Fire and Rescue as well. Thank you, Council Member, and thank you for bringing that uh, young person to us. And, and turning that turning that narrative and thank you for the courage for bringing up this discussion uh, it is 
after, immediately after George Floyd, across the state and in this county, there were a lot of efforts to look at what was going on in policing. And there was a lot of rhetoric. And I will tell you, and, and I didn't even realize the full, uh, the, the breadth of, of knowledge our young officers and employees had of social media, of news, of, of every digital format. And despite seeing messages from the chief, messages from command staff, messages that you are supported, they saw a different message and they interpreted it differently. And, and they will continue to interpret it differently. And what that has done is, I have talked before about, uh, the first of all, people that want to do this job is so rare now compared to when I started. So all of those young people that want to do this job, they're extremely critical of where they're going because we're all offering. The game, the, the, the field of play is changing every day. Last year, I talked to you about $20,000 bonuses. Now everyone's got $20,000 bonuses, $25,000 bonuses, $30,000 bonuses. Now they're hiring. Now the new trend is law enforcement specific recruiting companies that you can hire that all they're, all they're invested in is going and, and, and finding the best of the best in, in law enforcement candidates. And so that's now the, the game that's playing. But the one thing that we can do, and I, I, I will say this, I'll be honest. In the last six months to a year, I've seen the red, the, I've seen the tone of the council change, and I thank you very much for that, because they are the these young people that want to be here, and the officers that are here are watching that. They are watching it, and it quite honestly, it scares them, because they're looking at the they're looking at uh, uh, the people that hired them and entrust them with public safety, and they're hearing they could hear. They did hear, honestly, before, that you're racist. We think you're racist. We think that you're harassing people. We think that you're beating people. We think that you don't like, that you hate homeless people. We think that you don't, that, that, you're, that you're the most poorly equipped to deal with people of mental, mental, uh, with mental health issues. And quite honestly, that's not the truth, but that's what they hear. So stopping that rhetoric goes a long way to people that are looking at Montgomery County and looking at all these fantastic benefits that sort of line up with other agencies and where they see the other agency, well, I don't see anyone tweeting things. I don't see any laws being created that say that, 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 that go to a fundamental bias against police. Uh, I'm going to go there. So the more we can be, again, as you said, council member, cognizant, respectful of that narrative, cognizant that our words, words do make a difference. Uh, and, and I will say, again, I commend the council right now for the actions I've seen. I've seen a number of you at promotion ceremonies, at reward ceremonies. I've seen tweets. I've heard testimony of the support. That needs to keep doing, keep going, because the one thing we know in law enforcement for the thousand great things we do, it only takes one thing to undo it, right? The same thing for you folks. It's, it's across the entire, everyone's profession. You can do a thousand great things. It's the one really bad thing that's handled not the right way and it really, really uh, uh, can be devastating, especially for us when we're trying to hire from a very limited pool. I think we're on track and, and I thank you for that and we need to continue that way. and, and Whatever you can do, you know, when you go to these promotion ceremonies and the award ceremonies, the support for, for Sergeant Kep, fantastic, right? All of those things make a difference because it's part of the noise that, that all the candidates we want to hire is part of the noise that they hear. And we want to see them, we want them to see those, those actions by you, those actions by us talking about all the greatness. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I think that, um, you know, one recent example of tremendous collaboration was a discussion around the drone issue, um, which I think is a model moving forward that really balances in an appropriate and authentic way the legitimate concerns from too many of our residents with the stark reality that we are facing, both in recruitment and retention, wanting to make sure we have the best possible police force. Byron Rescue. Yeah, hi. Um, I don't know that, um our potential workforce and our current workforce um, 
see these issues in the same way as maybe the police have have experienced. Um, I, I think our problem mainly is that for the the folks out there that want a job in fire and rescue, um, it's not that they're turned off by Montgomery County. It's just, it's the fact that they're jumping on the first job offer that they get or a job offer that actually pays more money or the schedule's a little different and it suits them. Um, I think we need to continue to do things that actually turn them on to Montgomery County and really encourage them to, to want to work here and only here as a firefighter. So, um, and I think we're doing a good job of that. Jay back here, my recruiter, um, trying to convince folks that this is the best place best place to work, and I think we should continue doing that. I appreciate that. I may get back in the queue, but I will yield to colleagues for now. Thank you. Uh, council member, uh, I want to move to Council Member Fanny Gonzalez. Thank you. I have a couple questions, but before then, you reminded me to my dad. Uh, <laughs> it's a good thing, just because the whole speech of integrity that's how I grew up. That's your number one. My dad only had a third grade level of education. Uh, so I, although I went to college, we are, had two siblings. None of them did. I'm the only one, and they're very successful. So I'm also very proud to have Thomas Edison High School, the training school in my district. Um, I think it just, it just meant, it's, it was meant to be to have a school in my particular district just because of my background. I am interested on, on learning how we can support you more with this pathway that you can have with Montgomery College or the University of Cherry Road or, you know, to ensure that we can get more kids uh, falling onto that, um, that pathway. Uh, obviously, college is very valuable, as you mentioned. I went to college, but it's not for everybody, and that's okay. Um, in my view. So um, one, I have one question, and it's for both. My understanding is that the uh, cadet program that we have, you must be a United States citizen to be part of, to qualify to be part of the program. Meaning, you don't have, like, even if you have a green card, or, you know, you have TPS or asylum, you're legally here, you're not allowed to apply. That was my understanding. And if that's true, how can we change it? I'm, I'm the proud white wife of a former United States Marine. If you wanna be in the military, all you need to do is, is having a green card. You can be a permanent resident or a citizen, right? But if the cadet program doesn't even allow that, that's crazy, especially knowing that in this county, we're so diverse in a huge junk of the Latino population and immigrants, they're not, they're not citizens. Like it took me years to become a citizen. I was undocumented when I was in high school. So I gave you my testimony. So if, if you don't know the answer, please get back to me. And if I'm right, we need to change that. And I don't know if that's a state law or it's county. Not sure. You, do you have an idea? Yeah. So for the police, yes, you are correct. The, the current requirement is to be a U.S. citizen. But as uh, as I said when I started, we're looking under every stone and where can we tweak to the realities of our community. So we're going to research uh, yeah. why that requirement is there, make sure there's nothing, as you said, in state or county regs. Yeah. And, and honestly, when we, you know, just talking about, as you referenced, mm -hmm. you know, the pathway for a high school student uh, to an education and to a part with us, there should be, there should be a pathway uh, for those folks that aren't U.S. citizens that are looking to become U.S. citizens, yeah. right? So how, how can we uh, put that into our process? So you get back to me. Perfect. It took me 15 years Captain to Clark's become. Got a new, Captain Clark's got a new research project. Please do. And I can help you in any way you you need me to. Um, uh, what else? That That's my main question. Other than that, I, you know, when I was at the Wheaton Rescue Squad a couple of days ago, one of the kids, no kids, one of the people, one of the volunteers, was only 19 years old, Latina. So proud of her. And um, uh, and she felt this sense of, you know, pride of being there and making a difference and assisting our communities on emergency services, you know, how impactful that is. Um, thank you so much for all your work, and I look forward to the conversation on how we can fix this citizenship issue. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council Member Lukey. 
Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Council Member Mick and I got to giggling when, when you mentioned the, the parents coming in and, and speaking as part of that. And since Lieutenant Helton is sitting there, poor Lieutenant Helton had to go speak with me at a middle school before the pandemic. And two of my children were going to be subjected to our presentation. And they walked in and they hid their faces. And uh, they, they, they rose back up during the presentation, but they, they were definitely embarrassed at the outset. And, um, and I want to thank you for raising the issue of the importance of school resource officers in that community building and uh, mentorship role. Um, I know during my time at the state, we had a retired school resource officer who worked with us at the Center for School Safety named Mike Radinsky, and he's now with Howard County Public Schools. And he'd been an SRO for nine, uh, 17 years, sorry, in Hyattsville in Prince George's County. And former delegate, now Senator Alonzo Washington, was one of the students, and he and and Mike had been his SRO. So every time there was something coming down in Annapolis or people had questions, Mike would get a phone call from from Alonzo Washington asking asking what's the 411 because they had that relationship of trust that they built during his time in high school. Um, I wanted one of the, the the things that folks have been touching on are the gaps in where you can or cannot hire. And as I understand it, for the police department you have to be 21, but for fire and rescue it's 18. Is that correct? Okay. And then um, with the the difference in degree requirement or no degree requirement. Um, like, for example, I know the state police, you can be a high school graduate with a diploma. They'll help you get an associate's degree during your time in the academy, but you do not have to come to the academy already possessing that degree. Um, is that something that we could look at doing here? particularly given the, the collaboration with Montgomery College where, um, you know, that there be an expectation that before you are fully certified, you've obtained your associate's degree, but that helps bridge that gap of time as well um, for age. Yes, that's one of the things that, that we are looking at. Uh, we, we do believe there's a, a maturity that, that is needed, you know, the, that gap mm -hmm. 18 to 21. Uh, I know some terrific 18-year-olds, but sometimes we need to get a little bit more life experience before we make start making some of the decisions they're they're making. Uh, but we are looking at how can that pathway, right? How can we get you started with just a high school degree and get you to that college education? And and honestly, partnerships and funding is, is going to be one of the things. You know, one of the things that we're we, that we are evaluating right now, our policy and planning section is researching is is again, as I said, what's the magic uh, potion there? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, we think, we feel that part of it will be a collaboration with local universities to number one, either get credit for life experience, uh, number two, get credit for work in the in being in our police academy, uh, and then uh, number three, what kind of scholarship opportunities would be available for those committed to a law enforcement career in Montgomery County? I, I will say, I forgot to mention earlier, one of the problems with our cadet program is they are not tied to the Montgomery County Police if right. they come through our cadet program. Right. And what one of the things that we have discussed with the county executive and, and he is supportive of, is there a way to tie participation in the program and also um, scholarship opportunities, mm -hmm. uh, school funding opportunities in the cadet program, tie that to service to, to the department. And usually what you see is departments require a three or five year service uh, following that kind of investment by the county. And so we're exploring those programs that other agencies are doing and seeing what their successes and what their obstacles have been and, and should we engage in that here. Part of that would be have to be negotiated with FOP Lodge 35. Mm -hmm. A number of these things mm -hmm. would have to be negotiated because I will say that after you become an officer, there are things. So first of all, if uh, once you become an officer if we're in, and you decide to leave it, two years, part of is you're now represented in, in getting money back. That is something we need to discuss with the union. Mm -hmm. uh, also need to discuss just the whole concept of promotion, right? Because to be promoted in Montgomery County to a corporal, you have to have at least 60 college credits. To be promoted to sergeant, you have to have 120 college credits. And then 
the requirements go up to there. So how do we view those going forward, mm -hmm. which are part of the discussion we're having? And there is, um, and, I, and I haven't looked at it in a long time, but there was a piece added to the Maryland Higher Education Commission's you know, set of statutes um, during the Police Accountability Act of 2021 that allowed for scholarship funds to go for uh, officers who were furthering their education as a part of their career. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you and I in particular have spent considerable time talking about cannabis as a disqualifying factor. Mm -hmm. um, and and I know that I wrote a letter about it and, and Chief Jones and, and the FOP president signed off on it trying to get the state's um, certification body, the Police Standards Training Commission, to make the recommended amendments to their regulations to conform to state statute that was already passed two years ago. Um, and just to orient everyone, there are two separate sections of the public safety article. One says prior cannabis use is not a disqualifier for certification as a police officer. The other one says prior cannabis use may not be the basis for disqualifying an applicant for a position as a police officer. And yet we have a disconnect between the state law and statute and the regulations. Um, do you have any feedback? I mean, I keep nagging. Uh, have you all had any other feedback or um, had any other discussions about how best to deal with this disconnect at the state level? Uh, we haven't heard any feedback on on whether or not the state is considering. They they do have new leadership there, mm -hmm. and and we want to. We're going to continue to press the issue in conversations with them for changing it. So the other opportunity ar around that uh, is uh, that that we want to look at is is there a way to move forward with Lodge 35 under the current? If we don't get any traction on the state level, which let me be clear, I think Chief Jones, you have stated, the county executive stated is. The require MPCTC requirements should match state law. Right. Uh, it just makes sense. But if we don't get traction soon enough, because we can't we can't wait around. Uh, one of the things we can also do is talk to Lodge 35 about the testing that goes with it. If you make the des decision to hire someone that falls outside of that one year range, or I'm sorry, that falls in that one to three year range of cannabis use, and and is there a way forward internally where we do the required uh, the, the, the state required drug testing uh, if we choose to bring them on as, as a, uh, uh, a police officer, because at that point they will be represented right. and, and that needs to be worked through. So that's another avenue to go to. But and in, in coming back to uh, the council member's question about citizen, we, we're getting quick answers. Again, a lot of these things go back to the requirements of the state to be a police officer. Mm -hmm. So it is a requirement of the state to be a U.S. citizen right. to be a police officer. So that's possibly another conversation that we can have with the state on mm -hmm. in in the wisdom of where our country is today. Mm -hmm. Is that something that needs to be looked at and changed just like the cannabis law? And then to another uh, one last follow up, and this was something that Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez brought up as well, which was that integrity piece and, and how do you best teach kids and get them sort of involved in, in that and seeing through that lens. There is a program in Virginia called the Virginia Rules that's run through um, the Virginia Attorney General's office. And uh, it's a program that it's state specific um, law related education program for middle and high school students. So it's a collaboration with their public school system, but it is run out of the Virginia AG's office. It was something that I volunteered to make Maryland specific if Maryland had wanted to adopt it. It was not something that um, happened during my time there, and I don't know if anybody's carrying that torch anymore. However, it is something that we could do for the county. Um, so we can certainly teach about state law uh, in the county, and if it want to be make it a program for the county, I would wholeheartedly volunteer my time to still make that program comply with Maryland-specific law for, for use by our uh, law enforcement partners and our school system to help educate our middle and high school students. I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Lukey. Councilmember Balkum. Um, thank you. Uh, I want to start by thanking Assistant Chief uh, Sanford. Uh, I know that you're great at your job because when we came there and you hosted us, I was way outside my comfort zone and you were very kind to me. So thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Um, and uh, so I, I, I think the conversation about how do we get kids on the payroll as quickly as possible because I think what happens is 
when they graduate from high school, if they're not going into a traditional uh, uh, four-year path or a two-year degree path, they're going to take the first job that comes along. If it pays $16 an hour, that to them is a lot of money. And so I think that we have to look at how do we get them, how do we get them quickly? Um, of course, we want the right kids uh, with the right, um, uh, all the, the constellation of characteristics that we need, but I, I think that that's important. Um, so as my colleagues have talked about, the, um, the college degree, I think, is just really important. And my friends from Montgomery College, they know how much I love them. Um, but I think that we have to have this conversation, and and uh, you're, th you're so I think everybody here is interested in how how do we move that forward to look at pathways, and particularly the promotions. I didn't think about that, but that uh, you know even if you do um, get in, you know, with a two-year degree, then you have to if you're going to move up and if you're going to spend your lifetime in Montgomery County in the career, I think we need to look at it. And I think that, as, as uh, Councilmember Frenny Gonzalez mentioned, I, I, I've come from a family of six. Only two of us have college degrees. Uh, the other four have very successful, have led, have very successful careers. A couple have different certifications in, in their fields. Uh, so I think that, and the world has changed from the perspective of whether we need a college, a formal college degree um, to do a specific job. So I'm very much in favor of how can we move this forward. And the other piece of that is um, from a diversity perspective, um, first generation college goers, that could be such an, uh, an obstacle that they just can't even foresee the possibility because uh, we all know um, and this is something that Montgomery College does very well, is to bring in those first generation uh, st students and they need, they need an extra hand holding. And so I, I think that that really can be limiting uh, to, a, to a large group of people that we're, we're kind of putting by the wayside. Um, so I think that's an issue. But also this is something that I was going to bring up in the next panel uh, with the HHS is the scholarship issue. Because uh, one obstacle is just the fact they can't even foresee going to college. The second obstacle is the cost. And so as an employer, I don't know what Montgomery County does as an employer to provide scholarships specifically. I was going to bring it up with HHS because we have a big issue there in filling those positions that require uh, degrees. But I think that I think that as an employer we need to have skin in the game. So I think the scholarship um, uh, a scholarship program is really important. I don't know if you have anything else to say about that. So right now we, we do have a tuition reimbursement program that's helpful, right? People can get a few credits each year uh, towards, towards their uh, education, and that's mandated through contracts. So we have a start there, but we feel like there, there needs to be more done, and, and it, I really think it's going to be a combination of efforts. Right now, and, and I know a lot of kids just, and I see a lot of people here with kids, I'm going through the process of that, writing the fa uh, completing FAFSA. the FAFSA, <laughs> that thing in and of itself is a nightmare, um, a nightmare. right? An obstacle. Yeah. Uh, so I'm completing the FAFSA, and 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 which is going to lead to more opportunities of scholarships and mm -hmm. and 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 funding for schools. So you know, getting people acquainted with that process because I don't think a lot of I didn't know about it until my kids got into the process, and even then I didn't realize how important it was mm -hmm. until my kids beat me up about it. So. Uh, having education on that to help help with the process, also looking at what we can do n locally, uh, you know, with uh, if we decide we want to make that commitment, what more can we do in our budgets to put money towards that process and and figuring out and as I spoke to figuring out what the what the what the magic potion is, you know, how long is how long should we expect it to take? I'm happy to say that right before we sat down, uh, we got an email from um, 
uh, Dean, Dean Robinson, uh, to sit down with Montgomery College about our cohort and other future opportunities. And that's going to be part of the discussion, how do we move forward? And I've actually got a 430 panel discussion over at Universities of Maryland that I'm taking part in, and I'll make sure that that's part of the discussion that we hook up. And how do we link up so that we can get uh, more scholarship funding for public service? Where can we tap into that? And we'll, we're going to tap into our public's, our, uh, into our schools uh, network of experts on, mm -hmm. on how, how we do that. Right. Because if we look at the $20,000 signing bonus as an incentive, we need to look at this, the potential of tuition as the incentive. And there's a, a horse before the cart scenario of not requiring the, the 60 hours before they can even qualify. But so if we can get through that hurdle, let's look at the tuition hurdle. Uh, and I think that that's because they're, if they're not, if they're not going off to, to, to a four year degree, or even if, if they don't know, if they don't have their career plans laid out, we're going to lose these kids because they're going to, they, they're, Many of them are supporting their families. They're going to go and get a job. And uh, if they can't start with you the day they get out of high school. Um, so, and, and I think the age, the age is an interesting thing from a maturity perspective. Um, uh, so I think that you, what you've heard is that we are all partners here and, and trying to help figure this out. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And I wanted to come back to your to the, the comment you made about hand holding. I will say across the board, and we're looking at generational differences, and, the, and please don't take this as a negative, but if you are not in your resources intuitive, if you are not, uh, you know, if it's not easy, we're seeing people drop out of our program, drop out of, it doesn't matter their background, uh, they drop out of it. One of the biggest things we have right now uh, and we just had a telethon uh, to call back the 300 plus people that, or not three, I'm sorry, the 250 plus people that never completed their background investigation. They put in an application and they never took it any further. And so we're trying to get to the bottom of why that is and we're finding it's, it's really a whole number of things, whether it be they see disqualifiers in the background and they think, well, they're not gonna take me, or honestly, it's a 35 page document, that's a lot of work, right? Um, and, and how can we, assist? and the reality is, and, that, and that's, not to, that's not to knock them, we have to adjust to who these kids are and adjust to how they learn and adjust to how they operate. So we're taking those steps and even just, and, and it's silly, and this is one of the things that I've been focusing on, going to our website, is it intuitive, is it attractive, does it, does it, it's not. I'm working on it. I got a great technology director that's working on it, but all those things kind of go into the uh, uh, how you make the sausage, and, and we're working hard at it. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Mink. Thank you. Glad to be having this conversation today. Um, question for everyone: uh, Could you speak to housing costs and cost of living, uh, and the impact on recruitment and retention that you all are seeing in that regard? So um, uh, last Academy session, uh, we had a, a recruit who brought his family down here and looked at housing in uh, Montgomery County and were shocked. He did not make it through his program because he lived in Delaware and commuted three hours each way every day. Um, that recruit is back. They found some housing. Um, I don't think it's in Montgomery County, but it's local. But that was the challenge. He was in his car six hours a day, five days a week for a couple months with a family, um, and it obviously became too much. So that that is the reality that, that we do face. For uh, our departments, uh, close to 60% of uh, our officers live outside the county. And it's a reflection of the housing market. It's a reflection of, of uh, the, I mean, I saw an estimate of what my house thinks it costs now. And <laughs> I was like, hold, oh, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, that's not the way it used to be. 
it's not the way it was when I started. It was not the way it was 10 years through my career. But prices have skyrocketed. It becomes an obstacle. And I do think people find solutions outside of the county. The problem that that causes for us is service. Because if I have people that are doing an hour commute uh, and coming in here to work, are they tip top, right, number one? Number two, can they stay? The reality is we got to work overtime. Do they have the ability to stay and work overtime? Where are their kids going to go? You know, it it would freak me out. You know, if I didn't live in the county when my kids were little, that I would live an hour, an hour and 20 minutes away from my kids if, if there was some sort of an emergency. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it is a real problem. And going back to uh, Council Member Albernaz recognizing the $2,500 credit, that's a big deal. That's $200 a month. You know, so that's a great start. But there's certainly more that we can look at doing uh, with the, the, the council's help. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. But uh, I think for fire and rescue, we tend to see it a little differently um, because of our shift schedules. Mm -hmm. Most of our firefighters work 24 hours on, 48 hours off. Mm -hmm. So when they first start working here, uh, their salaries are a little lower. Um, they tend to get apartments or, or share or they live with family but as their career progresses and they start earning a little bit more money they start looking to buy houses and it is cheaper to buy houses in other counties in Maryland and other states um, we have folks that uh, live as far as way as uh, in Cape May New Jersey that commute twice a week to work um, it just depends on their situation but if could make it more affordable for them to live here that would be you know ideal absolutely yeah that makes a lot of sense I mean the given the difficult climate for um, purchasing or even renting a home in Montgomery County I do think that uh, it would be worthwhile in the county to look closely at workforce housing partnerships and what could be done in that space I mean this impacts all of our county employees across the board it's such a huge issue and that could really help us stand out as employers increase the number of staff living in our community um, and help raise take-home pay for our folks. So, and, and especially, you know, we've got a lot of great partners uh, in the nonprofit housing space and developer partners in the private space. And I, and I think that this is certainly something for us to look closely at. So thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, Assistant Chief Sanford, you did mention uh, about the two students who ended up ineligible. Um, after going through the um, uh, after going through the academy program, I wanted to see what the deal was with that. Uh, academically, they didn't. Uh, they were they met the standard to remain in class and to continue mm -hmm. taking, uh, attending, and and participating in the program. They did not meet the requirements to be eligible to take the national or Maryland EMT exams. So they they were academic issues. Mm -hmm. um, which didn't eliminate them from the high school cadet program. They did um, uh, disallow them from taking the national Got test. It. Is that a problem that you see uh, in any kind of numbers? Is there anything like remedial that can be done on our side to help tee them up for the next round? Uh, we, we, we have a lot of remediation that we do with them. Uh, we, the instructors put in a lot of extra hours to try to get them where we need them to be. Um, in some cases, it, it's, um, you know, a, maybe a, a little uh, too late in the program by the time they are, you know, kind of well into it, um, you, you know, getting them where they need to be. But we usually pick up on that pretty early in the program. And interestingly, we've, we're, we're finding that in our recruit school as well. Um, kids don't take tests the way they used to when we were younger, mm -hmm. uh, and there's we're finding that we're having to make a lot of adjustments uh, to help folks be successful in in the testing environment. Thank you. Um, for for both of you, the partnerships with MCPS that you all have uh, been developing over the years and expanding, uh, you know, I'm on the Education and Culture Committee, and so I'm curious, you know, in our conversations with MCPS and with the Board of Education, are there things from their side that would be helpful in helping you to grow and expand the programming that you have there? Or to expand the reach, to expand the um, the knowledge that students have about the availability of these programs, are there things that you sh that you all see that it would be helpful for us to be having conversations on that side? Um, 
Now, like I said, um, we spoke yesterday, and um, part of the conversation that we had uh, with MCPS yesterday was mm -hmm. continuing to expand our partnership, where we have potentially, and that's just for this year, 113 future candidates, and continuing to grow our involvement with MCPS, being in front of the students, mentoring, talking, assisting, um, and then it also has been reciprocated where um, uh, Sean came and uh, was with the uh, Explorers one evening. So it's, it is a continuing building partnership with with this, and it, it, it's great to see this program grow and next year grow more and more. So I think we're, we're continuing to look for those opportunities and how to expand it. it, it Part of the challenge that we have is with, is with staffing because we need people to go into the schools and, and to be able to uh, help out and give that experience, give that perspective. You know, right now is, you know, of course it's not an ideal time because we are so many officers down. But we're looking at opportunities. We're going to continue to talk with MCPS. How can we get in there and have these kinds of, even an after school program, you know, when Chief Jones first took office, he was talking about bringing back PAL. Unfortunately, conditions on the ground don't allow for that right now. Uh, but we, we do want to continue to look at that and get back to those programs. And but it but it is it is staffing intensive, which which is a challenge right mm -hmm. now. For fire, uh, I'll definitely echo the staffing issue. Um, it, it's as I said earlier, it's these are very very instructor heavy programs. We need a lot more instructor staff, and we need space. Mm -hmm. uh, we we don't you know uh, we're the enrollment in a uh, high school cadet program is is limited um, and part of that limitation is based on space we don't have enough room to run any bigger programs than what we're running right now thank you uh, Assistant Chief Frank you talked about the integrity issues at play in the hiring process um, trying to understand patterns in that process can you tell us a little bit about uh, what are the top you know items that you see in an applicant's history that might disqualify them. The, the big thing, you know, we, we see a number of issues that come up. The, the biggest issue when I speak about the integrity is we do a very thorough background investigation. So we lay it all out. Please let us know about all of these things that you have done. And why that's important is, number one, you find out what individuals have done, but then it gets to the polygraph. And where we, we continue, well, first of all, I we do believe we have we have information that people look at the hiring requirements and they didn't realize they couldn't do that and get hired as a police officer you know i i couldn't be involved in a theft scheme and you know i couldn't have been involved in an aggravated assault and you know uh, so they self-select out not necessarily and, and sometimes they don't have the full breadth the full knowledge they they don't understand that it is a process and that uh, the main thing we want is for you to be honest with us but what we do end up seeing when people do select to go through the background investigation and they get to the polygraph, right, if there's not any automatic disqualifiers around selling drugs, around, you know, committing a robbery, around things of that nature, uh, when they get to the actual polygraph, they lie. They say, oh, I put everything in there. And then when the polygraph comes up, oh, I didn't tell you about that. So where that's a problem for us is we are entrusted with enforcing the law. We are entrusted with going and testifying in front of a court saying, yes, this person committed this crime without a doubt and they did X, Y, and Z, and that person is subject to jail time, subject to fines, subject to you name it. There's no polygraph there. So we have to know when you start this career, you understand what integrity and character is because there's going to be less opportunities to challenge that in the future. So it becomes, it becomes a, very, a, very, a very interesting problem. And when you, when you look at the decreased numbers, I've testified before, you know, when I applied, there's 4,000 people. Current classes now, there's 400. And so when, when those few people make it through, we need everyone to be really on target with their integrity and character and understand what that is. Because, and I, and I want to reiterate, it's not that you've done something in your past. Uh, we want people to tell us what you've done because we can tell you whether or not the state disqualifies you, whether or not the county disqualifies you. We can work through all of those issues. It's the things that you're willing to lie to us about. And, and honestly, they end up being silly things, thefts, 
uh, things that you shouldn't lie about, especially when we say, please, for the love of God, don't <laughs> lie. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, it, it's just interesting how that, because our recruiters do an excellent job talk, talking that point home, yet we run into it again and again and again. Chief, I'll skip it. I'll, I'll jump in for a minute too. The uh, fire has the exact same situation going on, right? It's it's very very similar. You know, often enough, uh, for example, if you took a prescription medication that wasn't yours, right? So if you tell us about it, um, and we don't do polygraphs, but we do a very very thorough background check, uh, and when there are inconsistencies, that is a, a red flag for integrity. And although you know, we obviously, and very infrequently, do we have, um, you know, courtroom testimony type situations. But similar to police, we have scenarios where people are letting us into their lives in very, very vulnerable times, right? They're opening their front door and we're walking in when they're at their worst. Mm -hmm. um, and the, you know, the integrity that, that our people have to have in order for that to be um, reasonable is very high. Uh, so we, we have a, a lot of similarity with police in that regard. Thank you. I appreciate that. And then last comment, I just wanted to return briefly to the conversation about the environment here and its impact on staffing. Um, you know, I wanted, I, I had heard now a, a few times, and I think it's, it's a good thing to hear, that if we, we have seen, we've had some officers who have left this jurisdiction uh, for other jurisdictions thinking that they were going to find, you know, a better environment and ended up coming back here, which I think reflects well, certainly, on us, for, uh, you know, as, as seen through the lens of people who have now actually experienced it in multiple jurisdictions. Um, I want to make sure that our efforts to do things like civilianize roles where appropriate, um, to increase support for mental and behavioral health uh, and crisis response, to set appropriate guardrails as we did for the drone program. Um, you know, those are e efforts obviously that, that benefit everyone. Um, and, you know, and it, and it benefits everyone, uh, including our recruitment, um, when we make sure that those efforts are uh, painted by all of us as appropriate and, and as they are. And uh, I, I think that what we saw with the drone program, of, of we keep coming back to it, but it was just it was just such a positive experience. I think I think you know for for me personally, I think for the council for MCPD, hopefully for the relationship building for the community, uh, there was a lot of working together there and responsiveness and collaboration and communicativeness. So I think as we saw in that example, uh, this can be done very effectively if there is uh, you know buy-in from all sides and that communication and collaboration. So my hope is that we can continue to make progress as we have done in Montgomery County uh, and that we can do that collaboratively and to uh, but to continue to set those appropriate guardrails to civilianize where appropriate uh, but to be able to work to, together and do that collaboratively and, and, and I want to well shameless shameless plug number one yes we have many officers that think the grass is greener and they come back because we have a, we have, with the support of council, with the support of the county executive, we have negotiated contracts that treat officers very well. And I would dare say that we go to our, our other uh, partners and they have good contracts too. And folks don't understand what it's like to work in, I won't men mention a state, but they don't understand what it's like to work in a state where they say, oh yeah, you'll be at work tomorrow. I don't care that you only got three hours of sleep. or oh, by the way, I can fire you next week at the drop of a hat. And when they go and they see that, they're like, well, I don't want a part of that because it makes me unsettled. And I know in Montgomery County, I was treated well, despite the rhetoric, right? There are avenues that you're treated very, very well. And we have to do a better job recruiting, talking about those, and we've given our instruction to our recruiters to talk about those differences. Be mindful of your contract. Be mindful, don't, don't just listen to the noise, really kind of dig down in there and do some research. But going back to the Jonas First Responders Program, Montgomery County has been, Montgomery County Police has been on the forefront of technology, on the forefront of uh, progressive policing for, for three decades now. But an interesting thing is we just moved ahead and we did things and did it with, you know, the full trust that, that we were doing it, and, and please don't take this negatively. Now we're being asked very, very important questions. That's the kind of dialogue we need to have. We're not afraid of it. Let's have those conversations, as you said, with the drone as first responder. 
terrific interaction. It's, it's a great model for doing business, especially for a public that wants to hold their police accountable and wants to say, this is, this is how we want to be policed. Fantastic experience, and, and we look forward to repeating that with future initiatives wherever we need to, because we have nothing to hide, and, and we appreciate the support and, and, the, and the feedback that we got. We're going to have a great program, and, and again, we're going to be at the forefront on the East Coast. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Mink. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned those contracts that we all have voted for and supported. It's a big deal. Council Member Sales, our last one on this topic. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, everyone, for all of your updates. Um, I remember when I was answering the dozens of questionnaires about recruitment shortages and how we were going to fill those, and as uh, Council Member Meek mentioned, I'm glad that we are looking at uh, technology to uh, address some of those shortages with that pilot drone program. Um, just thinking about these cadet programs, since we're talking about pipelines, um, I noticed that there are currently with 176 vacancies in MCPD, um, an expected increase to 216 um, next year and 239 by 2025. Um, just thinking about the recruitment aspects of the program, um, I know that you mentioned space being an issue. Um, who are we working with for marketing? to recruit these students. And you mentioned the website and just had some initial feedback on the website, but if you want to respond. So for, for the police department, we are currently, again, the, the game keeps changing as, as we go about it. Other agencies get a little bit better. I'm, I believe some of the council members have saw the number of people that Fairfax County put into their class. Uh, they, they, they haven't shared every, all of the uh, recipe for what they did, but we, we have a lead on what, what they did uh -huh. uh, with the support of uh, Dr. Stoddard, the CAO, and, and also the county executive. We're looking at mar these marketing firms that are very specific and have built an expertise in a very short amount of time at finding uh, law enforcement candidates. Okay. And, and we're going through the interview process right now in that and seeing what they can do for us and the cost, and I guess I'll come back around to that. There's a cost. Yes. Uh, the, um, the old ways of doing business, you know, we have tweaked and tweaked and tweaked, and now it's just, con it has evolved. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're looking at uh, a couple of different firms to help target, and they're gonna help us target. One of the things that we're talking to them about is what is your approach to high school kids? What is your approach to college kids? What is your approach to the people within our own community? Um, what is your approach to getting us trans, uh, uh, lateral transfers from other department? And, and how can you be a fantastic partner for us that obviously we're going to pay you for? But who's going to deliver for us? Because we need to deliver because those are estimates, right? Mm -hmm. I would love to be able to testify to you in six months that I've not 20, 30 people off of those estimates. Yeah. Uh, that can only be that can only be good. I'd love to have a class of, I think we designed that academy class, I can put 90 people in there. I'm sure Captain Clark will figure out a way to put 100 if we can get them. Uh, because that's how important these, these filling these positions are because honestly it's wearing our officers out. Uh, they're tired. And, and they keep coming to work and doing the job on overtime. They keep sacrificing, and, and we owe it to them, and you all have committed to it, and I thank you again to filling these vacancies and figuring out how to, how to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I've seen the officers from seeing them in Frederick at tabling events and just um, all over uh, the county setting up their tables and trying to recruit uh, uh, new um, uh, officers. Um, I'm just wondering about some of the current stakeholders that we currently have. We have the Collaboration Council. I know that in the summer they did quite a few events around the county um, at community events and just uh, thinking about um, collaborating more with current stakeholders who serve our youth. Um, people that they already have established relationships with and spend time out of school with, um, if there are ways to work with them, the Street Outreach Network, to help with um, recruitment that way. 
Um, I'd love to assist in any way I can. Um, I was also thinking about the polygraph test. I realized that the um, uh, fire department does not impose a polygraph test, but the police department does. And just thinking about, you know, the polygraph tests and how um, nerve wracking that can be for a student or anyone. I mean, I have test anxiety for any test that I take. So um, just imagining what um, sort of barriers we can eliminate to um, increase the amount of folks that um, uh, we are trying to get into uh, the force. Um, when I was um, when I applied to be a substitute teacher, I had to do a background check, um, fingerprinting, and so I'm not sure what you're delineating from the polygraph test that you're not getting from the background test, and um, you know how many people we're losing at the point where we're um, administering the polygraph test would be helpful. So we're, we're working on, on calculating those numbers because we're doing it internally to have a better okay. understanding. But remember, there, there's two groups. There's the yeah. group that self-select out when they see the background investigation yeah. because they see all the questions we're asking and, you know, they're not going to tell us why they, they're yeah. not going to tell us the full reason of why they self-select out. But I, I do want to reassure you on the polygraph itself. So there's two things that goes on. Number one, sometimes we have people that have readings that are, the, the operator says, I'm, I'm not sure, and they didn't, they didn't admit anything. Mm -hmm. They were a little bit nervous. I, I just, we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. So those things we look at an additional time. But when I talk about eliminating people on the polygraph, I'm talking about people that outright, they, they show deception, and then it's admitted, mm -hmm. right? Because we do have skilled polygraph operators, and so there's an admission to a uh, crime mm -hmm. that they have committed that they tried to hide. Mm. And that, that's a problem for us. Yeah. And, and I don't think we should, and there is, I will say there's movements across the country uh, where people uh, have been debating the use of the polygraph. Mm -hmm. I think our history here has shown it's a valuable tool, especially when you talk about ensuring that, uh, I talked about earlier, the one bad thing out of a thousand, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the more we can do to reduce the risk of that because it could be catastrophic. Uh, for a county, for a community, uh, for a department. I, I think it's one of those tools we need to continue to have in play, but we'll continue to evaluate our usage of it to see if we're, to make sure that we maintain best practice. Yeah, it would be good to see which departments are still um, requiring its usage and which are not and what their recruitment numbers look like. Um, I think there are other ways to um, you know, identify deception and, you know, what's done in the dark will come to light. Um, they can try to hide, but um, I've seen some very thorough background checks that um, we can do. So I'd love to see the data before we um, make a definitive decision to continue and see what our options are. Um, um, I know that uh, we have uh, approved the um, uh, the uh, bonuses for recruitment and I know it, we haven't had much time since it's um, uh, been in practice but um, are we seeing any um, increase in the numbers I'm just um... so with the current class this is a winter class it's kind of off off schedule for when people graduate from college so we do having uh, slightly more numbers this year like okay. when I say slightly more of I looked at them the other week, like about 20 more applications mm -hmm. uh, than the previous one where we instituted partway through. So uh, we're continuing. The one thing I will say about the bonus is that uh, we are surveying, because that was part of doing, doing the hiring bonus, we are surveying, and it is something that they are absolutely considering. It's, it's, it's uh, one of the... Uh, there's, there's five categories, you know, okay. one being not an influence, five being a, a great influence, and everyone is scoring in, in the 5-4 range on the importance of that bonus in, in getting them to put the application in. Okay. So from, okay. from the information we're seeing, it's making a difference. Uh, I really mm -hmm. think when you add, as I said, uh, 
our did our soon to come digital campaign and really targeted uh, hopefully through one of these specialist companies I think that'll also it's it's part of the mix of getting people in the door okay and I don't I want to make sure this numbers correct but it looks like um, the department has only hired 24 um, cadets from the police cadet program since 2016 correct okay so no. again that goes mm -hmm. back to number one they're not tied to our department so we had we've had cadets that go to other departments uh, we also have cadets that didn't pass the background investigation when they got to hiring being hired as a police officer okay. uh, for doing things that they shouldn't have been doing mm -hmm. uh, so you know we caught that in backgrounds but we are looking at uh, finding a way to tie participation in our program or at least tie those benefits we talked about college education scholarships to to that to retain all the cadets we can since we've invested in them yeah and, and, and council member uh, one you. of the things with that and and chief frank mentioned this earlier about expanding hours one of the issues we're trying to address um and I actually was just talking with our coordinator earlier today um as i was walking out to come down here is our cadet program is a maximum of two years so we currently have, he called a, a rock star cadet that's going to be uh, finish his sophomore year in the spring. That cadet's not eligible to continue in our program anymore. So um, that cadet wants to uh, finish their degree, but we don't have that, that intimate contact with them for two years. And a lot changes mm -hmm. for a college student in two years. Okay. And I, I, I said to the coordinator, I said, have them apply and work on getting their degree while they're here tuition reimbursement yeah. and it was it was a great conversation i said have that cadet come talk to me mm. um so that is one of the things we're also evaluating too because if, if they come in as a freshman and they, they graduate the program as a sophomore there's that two-year gap where they're not with us yeah um you know mentoring is such a huge part from keeping making sure that our teachers are being onboarded and staying uh, throughout the course so um, hopefully we can explore a component of mentoring within the police cadet program or anyone who's going to continue on in the program and I was just going you um, answer the question I was just wondering how many past cadets that we've trained and have gone outside of the county for employment I, I have to gather that number for okay. you but there's a number okay and my last comment thank you mr chairman was just about the the website you know i see at the top of the website it says montgomery county police department then i see the police cruiser and then all the way at the bottom i see the data i see the officers with the kids and i'm like why isn't this at the top i would love to see more pictures or even um, a rolling you know scroll of all the um, officers in the community because I see you all in the community and would love to see more of those pictures prioritized that's all I have thank you I'm gonna isolate that comment for my next meeting about getting this website revamped ASAP thank you thank you put it in the budget thank you very much councilmember sales uh, I just want to close us out on this part and thank you for our HHS folks for waiting patiently um, and uh, thank you to our public safety folks a lot of this has been about how do we remove the barriers how do we make sure we're supporting yeah. pulling it all together uh, and a big part of that is you know just making our what we're doing top-notch and I know you all have that as a goal we have it as a goal uh, uh, and that's what we're going to continue to do so appreciate it uh, we will move on to our next section uh, right now and uh, bring down our HHS folks Okay, great. And uh, we have Ms. Yao here, and we have, I see Dr. Bridgers coming down. I'm going to turn it over to the chair of HHS to lead us through this section. Um, and thank you all again for waiting. Thank you, Chair Jawando. While everybody is getting situated, I just wanted to briefly mention and continue to express our deepest appreciation to the department. Um, they, for uh, those of you that aren't aware, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services is actually the largest executive branch agency um, based on the number of personnel. 
um, but also reach as well. And we know that uh, just as we have had challenges across the country, uh, we are struggling uh, to both recruit and retain critical uh, employees, uh, social workers, uh, community health nurses, therapists, um, and, and, and many others uh, that have Pro just done incredible work, truly uh, remarkable work, not just during the COVID, but before and after. So we are going to hear from the department regarding uh, some of the current challenges they are facing, uh, where things currently stand, but also discuss some initiatives that the department has underway to help fill these positions and also discuss what policy opportunities there may be for this council to pursue, um, as well as potential budget implications. Um, but nothing is more important than the health and wellness of our community. And we can't carry out that health and wellness without these incredibly dedicated professionals. So with that, um, Ms. Yao, I'm gonna turn it over to you just to um, tee this up. And then Dr. Bridgers, I will turn it back over to you uh, to walk us through your presentation. Good afternoon. Um, I think that the HHS chair summed up pretty much what we're gonna be going over. I just wanna mention that we have representatives from DHHS here at the table. We also have representatives from Montgomery County Public Schools, Montgomery College, and un universities at Shady Grove that are available to answer questions if the joint committee has them. Yes, and I wanna express our appreciation to all of you as well. We've um, had a long-standing tradition of innovative programs uh, at the earliest possible ages that creates a pipeline. We need to strengthen and enhance those, but we have the infrastructure in place and we appreciate all your efforts as well. With that, Dr. Bridgers, I'll turn it over to you. Good afternoon, HHS Chair Albernos, uh, Joint Committee Chairs and Committee Members. Um, we've done a lot of work in this space and we still have a lot of work to do. I would be remiss if I didn't thank um, Director Anderson, our Office of Human Resources, our Office of Management and Budget, Director Bryant, our HHS HR team, and all of the great partners that you see behind us. Um, as Council Member Katz, who sat quietly over to my left, indicated, it does take a village. It takes a village collectively and cooperatively with all of the work we need to do in this space. Um, HHS Chair, Council Member Albernos, you um, really hit the um, nail on the head, if I got that term right, that um, COVID taught us a lot of things. We were able to use a lot of resources from our volunteers, from our partner agencies, working with the executive team and looking at the backlog of vacancies that we really didn't need to focus on then but we are really focusing on now with the work that we're doing uh, with our newly onboarded uh, Chief Operating Officer, Mr. Mark Hodge, who's actually gonna walk us through the presentation. But I just wanted to indicate that we've been working very close, again, closely with uh, OHR and OMB to look at those vacancies, those 321 vacancies that in November were 328. Now that's a slight delta and change in that, but it shows and indicate progress, the progress of a partnership, a sound partnership. We've also heard and listened attentively to the council ask about budget constraints and what the taxpayers are paying with their dollars as far as staffing. So we've really looked at that. We've also looked at how we could work with our workforce development partners and our workforce Montgomery, which I now am, will be uh, a member of if the county so votes me in on that next session that I'm presented as a member of the workforce development um, board within HHS. So we are really doing a lot of things. We're looking at innovation and change, but to do this work, we are a public facing entity that never closed during COVID. To do this job, you have to have dedication. You have to have compassion and you have to have empathy because we deal with the public and all of the challenges that our great citizens may have. They come to HHS, there is no wrong door. And we try to partner and refer all of our citizens to those specific areas where they are in need of. So I'll stop there and I'll turn it over to Mr. Hyde. My name is Mark Hodge. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for HHS. Um, so 
we have a lot of vacancies. Um, a large chunk of those are um, our social workers, community health nurses, and the, the, the um, eligibility workers that work in um, our Office of Eligibility and Social Services. Um, the part of the, the issues for social workers, there is a, a, a slight decrease in the number of social work students. Um, if there aren't um, people going to school for these things, it's harder for us to recruit them. Um, if there just aren't um, out there for, for, to apply for these jobs. Um, but specifically in the child welfare space, um, it is much more difficult. Um, e even if um, the uh, social workers are in school, they're not choosing child welfare as, as their career um, uh, coming out of school. So that makes it a lot more difficult. And really that's, I mean, it, it is specific to child welfare, but um, I'd say that about um, public service in general. So um, we, we, this is not always everyone's first choice. Um, when they're coming out of college is to work for a local government or a state government. Um, there are people who love that um, and look for that, um, but, but the vast majority of people coming out are um, usually looking for jobs in, in the private sector, not because um, we don't have jobs in the, in the public sector, but because it, it, that's, people are not taught to look in the public sector for jobs. Um, and that's, a, that's, a, that's on us. Um, and, and something that we need to be um, better at um, in, in convincing people um, of all ages, starting in, 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 um, in uh, MCPS, uh, MCPS, to show them that there are jobs um, uh, available to them. The community health nurses, it really is a um, salary um, issue. Um, we, can't com we can't compete with the hospitals. Um, we, we don't have the sign-on bonuses that hospitals have. We don't have the high salaries that, that hospitals have. Um, we don't have the three-day work week um, that, that hospitals have. Um, and those, those things are very um, uh, attractive um, to, to nurses, whether it's new nurses or, or those who have been in a, in, um, in a, a nursing career their, their whole time. It's, it's difficult for us to recruit. Um, but that being said, if we can offer them um, a, a chance to see uh, what, what it looks like to work for county government, it is far more fulfilling. I can speak to that because I was a nurse in a hospital, um, and then I became a school nurse um, and um, a nurse uh, manager and nurse administrator at Dennis Avenue um, in various, various programs. So having that background, I, I never expected to work in, in, in county government. Um, I was working in a hospital when I had an opportunity to, to apply for jobs. Um, I thought this might be temporary. Um, but 22 plus years later, I'm still here. So, um, so it's really just exposing um, people to to uh, what, what jobs in local government are really all about. Um, and then for the government assistance um, eligibility services um, uh, specialists, we have a large number of positions in OESS. We have large number um, of, of, of a high turnover um, of those um, of those positions. Um, really due to the, the large um, state required caseloads. Um, it is difficult um, for the best of them um, to keep up with that. Um, and so those who, who struggle um, in that job um, continue to struggle and it just gets worse and worse. Um, so the turnover ends up being high. And there's significant training requir requirements. Um, the state just Im implemented a couple of years ago a brand new um, uh, uh, IT system, uh, which was different than what they'd all been using before. Um, change is hard. Um, it looks prettier than the previous system, um, but it is a new system and they had to learn that. And so that, that's created some, um, some issues as well. Next slide. Here's our vacancy and um, caseload um, updates. Um, you can see child welfare services um, at the top of the, of the chart. Um, they're doing a, um, their caseloads are approximately 15 to 18 per month. Um, and Lisa Merkin is here um, who can speak more to that. Um, our um, vacancies on the lower chart um, in child welfare, we have 39 um, social work um, vacancies, um, including supervisors, um, among others. Um, in OESS, we have um, 25 vacancies um, in the GAS, JES category. Um, and then school health services, um, we have 10 um, uh, school nurse and 16 school health room tech vacancies um, for the moment, and I'll get to that in a minute. So what skills are needed? Um, we are front-facing, um, very customer-driven, um, resident-driven uh, department. Um, everything that we do um, is, is for the health um, and, and well-being of our community. A lot of our positions, m most of our positions, um, require um, a college degree, um, mostly uh, a bachelor's degree, but for social workers, the a master's in social work, the MSW, um, are required, um, if, if not just a, a college degree, um, all of those also include licensure, so um, nurses need to be licensed, so they have to take an exam and they have to um, pay for their license renewals every other year. 
um, social workers the same. Um, our school health techs become certified nurses' aides um, during orientation, but they have to um, uh, keep up their their um, their licenses as well, their certifications. Um, the ombudsman program and our licensing and regulatory staff um, participate in year-long orientation. Um, that's a state program, um, and at the end of that, they they can actually go out and start doing their jobs um, after they, they they receive that certification. So all of these require a long time, a, a lot of uh, training, and a lot of um, of, of education. Um, multilingual staff, because we are so front-facing um, in our in our department, multi multilingual staff are highly sought after for all of our positions. Um, we, we don't. Um, we, there's no single position that that we look um, for multilingual staff only. Um, it's really all of our positions. Uh, our issue is there just aren't enough applicants who speak other language who are languages who are applying for our jobs. Um, so that makes it difficult for us um, as well. Um, and then. Patience and compassion, um, and, and that's not something you can teach in school. Um, it's something that um, people uh, it, it, who come to work in, in local governments or in the healthcare field um, just possess um, as, 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 as part of who they are. So patience and compassion are good skills to have if you're going to work for, for HHS. The Welcome Back Center um, is a great program. Um, it is a national program. Um, we have um, one of the Welcome Back Centers here in Montgomery County. Um, they maintain about a 100-person uh, caseload uh, throughout the year. They are um, helping um, foreign-trained, internationally-trained um, nurses and behavioral health um, professionals and other medical graduates um, to get their licensure here. Um, we have um, a lot of um, physicians who are trained in other countries um, who come to Montgomery County um, who need, uh, who, who can't automatically just start to practice here. They need to go get, um, their, um, they need to take classes either through universities, um, which we help them with, um, um, or they have to take updates um, to their um, nursing licenses before they can become licensed here and take the, take the, uh, the NCLEX test and get licensed. Um, so the, the Welcome Back Center staff helped them with all of that. Um, in FY23, there were 26 participants that joined the healthcare workforce as a result of working in the Welcome Back Center. Um, depending on their, their educational readiness and English proficiency, um, it can take one to three years to become licensed um, in, in either um, as a physician or as a nurse or as, an, as a behavioral health um, a technician or professional. Um, it, it, just depending on um, what, what they still need to do um, and, and how much English they need to, to learn. Um, our unlicensed medical career jobs um, are sought um, while working on licensure. So someone who was trained as a nurse um, in their home country and wants um, to become a nurse here um, may be eligible to be a, a nurse's, nursing assistant um, while they are still working with us. Um, and so um, one of the things that um, we um, are doing with School Health Services um, we were working directly with the Welcome Back Center to um, to recruit um, um, some of those individuals um, who can become uh, uh, school health room techs or certified nurses aides um, as they continue to seek um, education um, and updates to their nursing licenses or other. Um, so um, that's one of the, the partnerships we have um, in, in getting um, some of these participants uh, into jobs here in Montgomery County. So other agencies, um, MCPS is our is a, a, a very um, good partner for, for everyone, including us. Um, and I apologize, I wrote Sean Handy. I have lots of Sean's in my life. It's actually Sean Brassa, um, who's everyone who everyone's been talking about today. Um, who's um, we are partnering um, in School Health Services and their career ready um, programs, medical careers programs in MCPS, um, who are learning to be certified nurses aides. Um, to um, form a pathway for internships um, and then to apply for jobs as soon as they graduate. The minimum requirement for a school health room tech is a high school um, degree. Um, and so when our, um, when our students uh, graduate um, and with their CNA, they can apply um, for the school health room tech position um, and, and fill those positions. So we're very excited about that. Um, Stephanie Zard is my um, partner um, in many things um, uh, uh, around the department. Um, and she's been um, integral to, um, to helping to get this to work. 
uh, Montgomery College and University of Shady Grove. Um, we have lots of nurse um, interns um, from, from both campuses. Um, we have MSW internships um, from the University of Shady Grove. Um, we have, and this is for you, um, Councilmember Balcom. Um, we have a, a child welfare um, fellowship pilot um, that covers tuition costs, internships, and employment. And, and then um, they come to work for child welfare upon their graduation. Um, and um, in a minute, I'll ask Lisa Merkin to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then we also have um, MOUs, uh, Memorandums of Understanding, with any other universities um, for public health interns, community health interns, nurse practitioner, and social work interns. Some of the innovations, some of the things we're looking at, and um, one of the things that I've been um, really focused on um, is um, the previous senior administrator in school health services, and now is the not just the COO, but also the acting um, chief of human capital um, and our labor um, manager as well, <laughs> taking on three jobs now. Um, so, but some of the innovations, and I'm, and I'm happy, I'm excited to be able to do this because now some of my ideas that I was using in school health services, I can apply really department wide. So we're looking at innovative ways to recruit, um, hire, and retain our workforce. Um, school health services has streamlined its hiring process um, to, to six weeks from posting of the position until start date. The, the way we are able to do this, um, we post it, people apply, um, the next week they come for um, um, it to one place um, for an interview, for um, a description of what the what the um, what the job is all about. And I think I talked about this before um, with all of you. Um, they are um, so they get their interview, they get their background check on site at that very moment um, before they walk out the door. Um, they get um, th they also have an appointment in hand as they walk out the door um, to go to, to OMS for their for their um, for their physical. And so before that would take months because they had to come back for each of those things at a different time. And many of our uh, of our applicants are working other jobs and that makes it really difficult for us. So we've been doing this on a Saturday morning um, at Dennis Avenue. We open up um, Dennis Avenue and we had um, 23. Um, we just um, uh, started a new orientation class from our September uh, recruitment. Um, uh, at the end of October, we, we have 23 new um, school health room techs and seven new school health room nurses. Um, and so um, our vacancies that you saw previously, where it said 16 um, school health room techs, we we're hoping that those 23 fill those positions and we should be down to zero. Um, our seven new school nurses as well. Um, and we have another orientation class. The, the, Orientations for nurses happen more frequently because we get fewer applicants, um, and um, so we do that. But we, we're expecting um, four more school nurses to be starting um, at the beginning of the year. So we should be able to fill those positions very quickly. And then finally, um, the MCPS School Health um, Collaboration um, that, that I mentioned before that should provide us with a pipeline of merit and substitute school health from techs and certified nurses aides. That's it. Press the wrong button. Um, was there another presentation, or we can jump no, right in? No, I, I just would like um, Lisa to talk about the scholarship. Sure, that'd be great. Oh. There we go. There you go. Okay, mm -hmm. now that's better. Thank you. Good afternoon. So yes, as Mr. Hodge talked about, we this year Child Welfare Services partnered with the University of Shady Grove because we realized there was, was an untapped market of students that we thought would be interested in the MSW program that we thought would be interested in public child welfare. We do have other partnerships with the University of Maryland with other master's programs in across the state, but not with USG. So right around the corner was sitting with a great opportunity. So we developed a pilot program where we are offering USG master degree students as an application process, the opportunity to come and learn about child welfare, a two year, typically the MSW internship program is two years, and we will pay, it's a stipend, but it really covers tuition and books, and they spend two years with us, which is a win for the student and a win for the department because most internships with child welfare are a year, and then you move on to a second year internship. So we'll have the students for two years, and then they will come to work for us in child welfare for two years as well. Of course, the hope is they will love us, that they will want to stay post the two years that they owe us for that stipend. 
we are looking to expand that and have additional four to five students in the next academic year. Part of just having two students was really about timing. It wasn't necessarily about interest. By the time things got put into place, it was late summer. The academic year really starts in August. Internships start immediately after that. So we have two students with the hope to have four to five additional students come the next academic year. Thank you. Um, obviously, it's critical because with the caseloads are uh, just outrageous. Uh, and so, and, and, and it compounds the problem, right? Because once the caseloads get to be too much, then more people are going to leave because the burnout rate becomes higher. And it just continues the cycle of, of challenge. Um, you had mentioned, and this is a different category, Mr. Hodge, but could you talk a little bit about what that delta is between the discrepancy in pay between hospitals and what we're able to pay here? Sure. So um, as I mentioned, just from the start, most hospitals are, are offering um, anywhere from ten to $30,000 sign-on bonuses. Mm -hmm. um, so right off the bat, they're, they're receiving in a one-time payment um, uh, that, that amount of money. Also, um, for, from a salary perspective, it tends to be about fifteen dollars to $20,000 a year more. So the one selling point that we try to to make with um, our applicants uh, in, when making their decisions or when they receive the offer letter and see that their, the pay is much lower than they expected, um, we do get on the phone with them and talk about the benefits that the county offers. Um, we, have, we offer better benefits from a health insurance standpoint, um, from the cost of health insurance um, and, and other um, days off, the amount of days off, the amount of, um, of holidays, um, we are better than, the, than gen generally than the hospitals are. Um, and um, they don't work weekends. They don't work nights um, in, in the in mostly, um, except for maybe at the crisis center. Um, but most of our community health nurse positions um, are just daytime, weekday positions, um, which can also be um, very attractive to nurses. And then for our school health uh, nurses, one of the other benefits that we have is, especially for, for um, uh, applicants who have children, um, it, it more or less mimics the school day. And so they're, they're, they're able to, to be off um, when the, when the um, students are off, when, they're, when their children are off. Um, and they're able to get home at reasonable times, um, so aren't, aren't necessarily always paying for, for um, child care um, after school. So there's, um, so there's some benefits, but there's about a fifteen to $20,000 delta in the salary. Recognizing budget's always a challenge. Is the administration exploring in this budget that the county executive will be presenting the possibility of looking at bonuses, particularly in the child welfare space and others where I think it, you know, we're reaching crisis levels? So um, we, we were able to offer retention bonuses to school health services. We got um, two grants from the state um, workforce um, grant um, that allowed us to give retention bonuses to all of the um, frontline um, school health and techs and nurses in school health services. So they're about to get their second one um, in the next few weeks. Um, right before Christmas, um, that was well timed, I think, for them to get twelve hundred dollars, um, a second, um, uh, second twelve hundred dollar check. Um, from a sign-on bonus perspective, and that's something that has to be bargained, um, and so um, that is something we are very interested in doing. Um, I know that um, also um, every year there's a classific uh, there's a list of classification studies that are done. Um, this year, um, the nurse salary schedule, the community health nurse salary uh, salary. Um, or wage schedule is being looked at as well. Um, and they'll use that to compare to um, what other nurses um, in, in similar positions are making, but also um, in the community and what it may cost. So we're hoping that um, not, not just for bonuses, but, um, uh, but also for an increased salary structure um, for nurses um, uh, moving forward. Um, so that should be part of the FY25 budget. Um, I'm not, I can't say that for sure about um, the, the bonuses, but certainly for the for the increased salary once that study comes out. Dr. Brady. And Councilmember Albanos, in addition to Mr. Hodges, um, um, sharing that we have looked into those um, budgets, those in, uh, incentivized recruiting uh, strategies for our budget, I must say, um, in our behavioral health and crisis services area as well, because we know we need clinicians, psychiatrists, um, psychologists as well, and we've been working very diligently um, doing the collective bargaining agreement to look at ways that we can incentivize. So I wanted to add that as well. Thank you. Um, I know in law enforcement we did very comprehensive evaluation of local jurisdictions to do a salary um, 
just to, to look at how we competed with other jurisdictions. Have we? I'm sure we have, but could you articulate how we compare to our colleagues in neighboring counties, both in the state, but also in the district and in Virginia? So across the state, um, in, in all local governments, except for Montgomery County, uh, all the nurses are state employees. Um, the state um, pay rate is lower than the county, the, our, our current county pay rate. Um, it's improved slightly. Um, they have gotten a series of raises um, over the past um, year or so, um, but it still is lower than, um, than, than Montgomery County. That being said, there's also far fewer nurses um, in other jurisdictions as well, because other jurisdictions from a budget standpoint have chosen to use unlicensed staff to do a lot of the things that our nurses are doing now, which is, in my opinion, as a nurse, dangerous um, and, and very concerning, um, and that, um, that, that I hope would never happen in Montgomery County, that, that we value the, the nursing services that, we're, that we provide, as we're seeing um, during COVID when we were using our nurses to provide testing and vaccinations. Um, things that unlicensed people um, were, were, were not able to do as, as well. Um, and so uh, other jurisdictions, um, it's difficult to compare to um, D.C. because all of the D.C., um, uh, especially for school nurses, are, um, are um, Children's National Medical Center employees for the school nurses. Um, and then um, from what I know, and I've, I've not looked at this recently, um, they're, they're other community health nurses are, are kind of on par with Montgomery County. Um, and I've not looked at, at Virginia, but I'm assuming that um, that will be something that when the salary study commences shortly um, for, for nurses, that that's something they will look at as well. And just to add, Council uh, Member Alvinos, I know that uh, Dr. Davis has also um, worked with the Metropolitan uh, Council on Governments to look at other jurisdictional salary and, and, and wage gaps as well uh, with the other health officials. And so she is working um, with, with the COG and with the uh, Maryland Department of Health to see where those um, uh, equity challenges are. That, that sounds good. Uh, my last question, and then colleagues, whoever wants to get in the queue, feel free, or uh, yield back to you, Mr. Chair, um, and then folks just let uh, Chair Juwana know, um, is, so obviously there's a lot we need to do in the short term, um, and, and we need to address this in the upcoming uh, proposed budget by the county executive, recognizing the needs are growing too, in addition to the challenges of re recruitment and retention of staff. but. Looking long term, um, we do have phenomenal partnerships in place with Montgomery College, Montgomery College University of Shady Grove, and MCPS. Um, and I actually had the opportunity to speak virtually to the most recent uh, class of graduating nurses at Montgomery College, um, which was like super inspiring uh, and, and an incredible experience. Um, but you mentioned the incentive program. Um, is that also something that we should look into for tuition reimbursement? Um, as another way for us to attract and retain some of our best and brightest uh, here in our community and then use that as a carrot going to the high school level um, for people who are looking for higher education options, realizing once they get to their senior year how expensive school is going to be and college is going to be uh, and maybe seeing that opportunity. Is that another option that obviously will have a budget implication that we should be looking into? So our current um, tuition reimbursement program is small. Um, I think that the, the maximum any employee can get um, is around $2,300, which these days pays for one class. Um, and it frequently runs out like by October or November. So people wait for the day it's released. They're, they're ready to click on their computers and sign up. So, um, so people kind of trickle on for the rest of the year, but um, that pot of money runs out quickly. So um, for, for us to be able to use tuition uh, reimbursement or, or tuition assistance as an incentive, um, we're going to have to grow that significantly um, to make it well. Um, it, it, one class, to pay for one class is good, um, but it's one class for one semester. Um, and so uh, if, if you're having to work or you're, or you're having to rely on other um, means for, for paying for that, um, it's paying for one class in one semester isn't always uh, an incentive, um, and, and you, it often runs out. So that's something we have to certainly look at, and it's something I'm happy to bring up with the county executive um, as we look at, um, and it's not specific to um, HHS, the, the 
tuition incentive or tuition assistance programs for all county employees so which is why it runs out very quickly sure. um, it could be something that we dedicate to HHS as a separate pot of money for for those hard to fill positions um, we need more social workers to go to school if we can um, do the, the things that we're doing with um, child welfare to have more scholarships available um, to um, for nurses or for, for, for other social workers um, that's certainly something that is um, seems to be working and it's a good pipeline for us um, and, and a way for us to ensure that we have for at least two years after graduation um, some some help from from these uh, from these graduates so but I absolutely will bring that up with um, with OMB and with the county executive that'd be great and I'm sure I'm not alone in saying let's get aggressive here um, let's because if you look at the cost-benefit analysis of an initiative like that it's sort of a win-win-win um, all the way around um, and I think would make a lot of walking around sense so with that I yield back to you mr. chair thank you uh, really appreciate the work uh, that, that you, you all are doing and the, it, I appreciate that you're doing three jobs it's not not great um, but <laughs> given the conversation but I'm sure yeah, I know you have you delegate well and you've got a good team um, I wanted just two questions and I'll pass it on to, to other colleagues the child welfare services positions that you start that you talked about could you what are the so what's the vacancy level right now there Introduce yourself with you. Hi, Lisa Merkin, the Administrator for Child Welfare Services. So the numbers are a little bit better that were, that than are what reflected in the packet. So currently we have one manager three position, we have one supervisor position, we have 35, give or take, social work vacancies. And then within the last year we moved some of the child welfare classifications to a child welfare caseworker. The difference is both have master's degree requirements, but the child welfare caseworker doesn't require the license. So we've been very, very successful in hiring for those positions. We had, we already have a few in the agency, but we moved five, and we are in process of selection and was moving forward for all of those. We have two community service aid positions. Those aren't as difficult, challenging for us to hire as a social work master degree licensed positions are two vacancies for the C CWS for the child service um, for the sorry, community services yes yeah, so it says six yeah, but yeah. in the process we have been able to work toward filling those and could you give just a sense of the the numbers mean something but what what does that mean like for the work the day-to-day -day? like what that seems like a lot a big number to me and in a very in a really important area can you just what's the impact on the caseloads and the work Sure, I, I appreciate that question because there is a difference between caseload and workload. So caseload is a number, but the workload of the cases, <clears throat> excuse me, that the staff are seeing, they are complicated, challenging cases that take a lot of time. And as someone said today is that when you don't have staff, the remaining staff are those that manage the families that we want to and require to work with. So it's, it's, challenging it's frustrating at times um, it's not just recruiting staff it's retaining those staff in times where they feel really really overwhelmed it's not just the social work staff it's the, the that are case caring but it's also the supervisors that are managing and, and overseeing and supervising the staff that are carrying these really high cases across the agency I appreciate that and thank you for lifting that up I, I know it's difficult we've talked about this in the past mm -hmm. and I talked to families it's just it, this is the area that just I a lot of us lose sleep over in, with this area mm -hmm. um, in particular obviously there's a ton of important work you do my second question which you kind of started with mm -hmm. were the qualifications you know something that I've been bringing up constantly other colleagues have brought this up is we have a third of our f residents foreign-born they come many about half of that third come to this country with some advanced degree or, or professional uh, degree they have difficulty transitioning. This is teachers. This is, this is not just in HHS. It's a lot of different areas. Um, I've asked for, you know, we, we just, we're doing state ledge. You know, a lot of those are state requirements. It, where are we with, in your sphere, this is a question I ask every agency in this, in this realm, and looking at, okay, you, you, you gave an example of, you, you took it upon yourself to reduce a requirement and reclassify mm -hmm. so that you didn't need a master's degree. But are there things that we need to be advocating with our state delegation to change that could leverage some of the qualifications of some of these folks uh, and others, not just foreign-born professionals, but others that might want to get into these fields but that don't have 
the current qualifications? Um, so I'll answer that. So I think one of the things I know that not outside of child welfare we've been, that has been considered is, and looking at is the BSW, a bachelor. So where is there room for a bachelor level staff to work with not just even child welfare, but aging disability and other fields, other departments that have social work positions. I, I think it's Is that currently else, allowed? You can just make that decision on your own? That would Well, there's require. a class of, it's classification, so I'll let okay. Dr. Bridges or Mr. Hodge speak to that. Okay. Yes. Well, I mean, we can decide within the county so, to do that. Yeah, ab okay. yeah, absolutely, we can do that. But it, we just have to change the classification sure. from in HR. But yes, that's okay. easy to do. Yeah. So, um, and I think the other big important piece is, as Mr. Hodge spoke about, is what does public child welfare look like? So I think there's some misnomers or maybe some miseducation about what is the work that we really do. So we've been working with the Social Services Administration of the state to say, how do we better talk about what is it that the real work is and how do we get that message to the master levels and really it starts at the bachelor level. You're going into college and we want you to think about social work and then we really want you to think about public child welfare as a career option. Absolutely, yeah, when, I'm just, in my point is we need to be working it from both ends. Correct. Like it's such a crisis that we need to be ramping up the programs with MCPS and Garvey College and USG, but also taking mm -hmm. advantage of people that are already here mm -hmm. and, and doing the whole picture. So yeah. appreciate the work. I'll turn to uh, Co-Chair Fanny Gonzalez. Thank you, um, amazing work. And um, there's something that you don't know about me. I, before I was on the planning board, even my first contract in Montgomery County as a business person was with the Latino Health Initiative. And this is, this is over 15 years ago. Before you had the Welcome Back Center, I did all the research about how we could uh, set foreign-born professionals in the healthcare industry, how to help them uh, get their licenses here. So I'm just, this is personally, uh, it makes me happy to see how far we had gone from back in the days. Uh, and the other thing, because I mean, my, my two colleagues already asked the questions that I have. I just want to give a shout out to my intern, Kelly uh, Villatorro. She is a dual enrollment um, student. She goes to Wheaton High School and Montgomery College at the same time, and she's going to be graduating with two degrees uh, pretty soon, and I'm very proud of her and uh, every other student out there who's taking advantage of this amazing opportunity that is only happening here in Montgomery County. Another reason why Montgomery County is such an amazing place to live. So uh, I'll yield back. You're here. Uh, Council Member Balcom. Oh, um, thank you. Uh, so yes, thank you for, um, for the presentation and for your dedication um, as uh, uh, Council Member Jawando said, this is the kind of stuff that keeps us up at night, right, is, is how are we uh, filling the, th this vital, vital service. So I think that very similar from the discussion that, that we had with the police, and thank you for uh, your patience. Um, so I think, and, and I don't know if it's, a, if it's a, something that we need to look at, it's certainly a budget issue, but I think we need to do change the dynamic of looking at this tuition reimbursement, not as a benefit, of course it's a benefit, but as an employer, we need to do much more than, um, than providing a benefit to an employee as, as part, of the the part of the compensation package. We need to look at tuition reimbursement and scholarships as um, a critical way that we can fill these slots. So I don't know if that's something that we would do through, um, you know, through your budget. Um, I know the college has a program for nurses uh, with, with USG, just in general for nurses. But so I think that I would like to see some kind of proposal of how we can fund someone's education uh, and not just a credit at a time. So I think that's, and I know that it's expensive and I know that we're going to be facing budget constraints again, but um, we have a responsibility as an employer to fill these slots and if we can't do it on the open market, we need to help pay for it. So that's, that, that's one issue. Um, and then I also agree with uh, uh, Councilmember Albernas about a compensation um, and of course uh, I, I we 
we have had an ongoing crisis for school nurses long before COVID occurred. And that was before we saw, um, you know, the, the, just the number of candidates uh, dwindle post COVID just because of, for so many reasons. So I think it's important that, you know, if we have to, if we have to raise the, our compensation package uh, to be competitive. Um, so I, I think that's kind of where I'm coming from in this regard. Um, and again, thank Montgomery College for, and USG for their partnerships. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member uh, Council Member Mink. Uh, I totally agree with the with that as as raised by my colleagues um, and uh, you know the return on the investment as stated is a huge one there and so I think when we think about the expense to the county we can't think of it just as the output here we also need to think about it as uh, you know this is the way that we are saving on the back end and we're making sure that these positions are, are fully staffed uh, so this is there's there's much more than an expense here there's a return um, that is in our benefit in the end I think a big part of this too um, as uh, Councilmember Alberno uh, referenced, is that uh, having programs like tuition reimbursement allows us to get is one additional way to get this in front of students when they're still in MCPS and to appeal to them there uh, before they hit the open market. So you know we have this great audience of excited students who are with us, you know, middle school, high school, they're starting to think about options and things that they're interested in. We need to make sure that this pipeline is one that they know about and that they're excited about and that they're seeing the benefits of uh, so that by the time they get to the point where they're really starting to make decisions, they know, okay, I could go into this pathway, I could go to Montgomery College, I could go to USG, I'm gonna have these openings that are waited, waiting for me, I'm gonna have tuition reimbursement on the way. Um, we have to, we're already losing uh, in a number of ways if we're not having the conversation and trying to and trying to pitch to folks until they are out there they already have their degree and their licenses and they're out and they're shopping and, the, and they're comparing our public offerings to the private offerings we have to the, the advantage that we have is the ability to build these really deep partnerships with the school systems while we're here so I think we absolutely need to need to tap into that um, I noticed that in the um, in the information that we got about the Welcome Back Center uh, of the so we've got caseloads of about 100 throughout the year with the Welcome Back Center, and in FY 23, 26 participants joined the healthcare workforce. It looks like none of those were in public positions. Is that accurate? That they were all in uh, that they were all private positions. Am I understanding that right? Except for the yeah. three that came to work for school health services um, in that time. So that's yes. a huge, Otherwise, it's outside of the county. Yeah, yeah so that's a huge government. area of growth that, that we need to really be tapping into. I mean, as we've, as uh, Council Member uh, Fanny Gonzalez touched on, we have all of these really fabulous candidates who are coming to us from other places and who are in need of employment, and we want to be capturing them in our public positions too. Obviously, we want all our hospitals staffed up, like that's all important. Um, so I wouldn't, it's not that I'm like, let's take away from the hospitals, right? We want to grow the pool of people who are excited to come and work in the public sphere uh, uh, as well, so it just shows that you know our marketing in that space needs to be much better as well. And so I think as we're thinking about tuition reimbursement, as we're thinking about pipelines, that is a really important one uh, as well uh, to be thinking about where can we get ahead of them, ahead of the curve, uh, to be putting putting this option in front of folks there as well. Really good point. Thank you, Council Member Sales. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much for all of the feedback. Um, just wanted to um, reference the um, question my colleague, uh, Chair Jawando, asked about the uh, child, welf child welfare services that the um, um, caseload. Um, just wanted to know if they um, are working over 40 hours a week and what's the average amount of um, uh, cases that they're managing each caseworker. How many clients do they have? So the case counts are a little bit different depending upon what service area you're in. Um, foster care, we count by kids. Family yes. preservation, we count by families. So 
investigations because a case can be open for 60 days. So I don't want to get into the, the complicated algorithms of, of one, month, one month versus another month. But our investigators can carry 14 to 30 something cases, mm -hmm. depending upon what the, I, what we don't can't control is who calls into child welfare. Yeah. Our family preservation workers are carrying around 10 to 12 and our foster care workers are 14 to 18 to, to 20. Mm -hmm. And how many, I guess, in-person visits are required with each client throughout that month? So there are some minimum requirements based on state guidance. However, mm -hmm. a family's a number of visits to a family is really based on what a family's need is. Mm -hmm. So although the mandate for an investigation is for physical abuse, you must go out to see the child and siblings within 24 hours and neglect is five days, depending upon what that family situation is, you're, the social worker is going out as many times as necessary. Mm -hmm. And that would be the same for family preservation or a foster care. Case. And foster care is on, um, it's on a more um, reactive basis, They or are they going out? Um, Not necessarily, well, yes and no. So okay. the state mandate is the, you must see the child in, the, in their living environment, home, with one time, um, at least one time a month. month. But I can tell you our social workers are going out many more times because of mm -hmm. as challenges or issues or concerns or the need yeah. of a child or yeah. youth becomes a parent, the social worker is out visiting that youth. Could be once a week, could be twice a week, it could be once a month. It really, it really is determined by whatever the case need is. Okay, and are we seeing an increase in staff working more than 40 hours a week? Yes. Okay, all right. Um, I did have a, another question about um, our, um, nursing program at Montgomery College. I remember an article a few weeks ago that was published in the Washington Post about the mental health crises of our healthcare workers. And just wanted to know about, um, we mentioned that, you know, we have really good benefits for our, um, our healthcare workers. Um, I know that in the last budget season, our public safety officials at the correctional facilities, they wanted like an on-site uh, mental health provider. And I'm just wondering what innovations you all are anticipating with not only um, increasing how we're recruiting the um, uh, workforce for nurses, um, knowing, are we assessing any barriers for entry um, into the program to um, strengthen that pipeline? And what are we doing on the job to keep the ones that we do have? And that's across all of these positions, which are really hard on the psyche for anyone in these challenging positions. So. <clears throat> So we haven't um, looked at that particular issue innovatively. Um, that there are certain, I think there are things we can do and should do um, in that space. Um, for our employees now, um, we have a very robust EAP program for the county. And I'm sorry, which space were you referring to? The recruitment of or the... Oh, to, 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 to address the mental health. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, the, to, to address the mental health um, uh, concerns that of our employees. Okay. So, um, are, are we are frequently making referrals to um, the EAP program. Um, it is a very um, robust program. Uh, they can do things uh, virtually by the phone. Um, they can refer them to mental health providers in the community. Um, if, if needed, our um, insurance plans um, all offer um, for employees and their families um, mental health um, um, reimbursed um, mental health um, services um, from their insurance companies. Um, but what we could do in, in HHS um, as, as part of that for our employees um, is something that we should we will start yeah. looking at. Yeah, like um, a walk-in. Yeah, we're so focused on the community. Um, and, and making sure that our services are yeah. available um, and that we're expanding those services to our community, um, we tend to forget about ourselves. Mm. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. Council Member Sales, if I may, let me just <laughs> add to what Mr. Hodge just shared. So during COVID, we had um, sessions where we would actually have our mental health therapists, clinicians come from our behavioral health and crisis services 
to meet with our to work with our MCPS partners, to meet with our school health room nurses, school health room techs, clinical staff. I've also had conversations with our public safety leads and directors to look at their um, clinical staff, to look at maybe um, coordinating to have a consortium of clinicians, not only for health and human services, but for other agencies in the county. Now, that's an innovative strategy that we've yeah. had discussions about, but looking at the gaps in services, looking at the deficits in um, clinicians that are actually available, applying for positions, mm -hmm. supporting not only our staffs, but our residents as well. Mm -hmm. So we need to think intuitively um, and other strategies that we yeah. can use the resources that we have. If we have fire and rescue psychologists, if we have um, um, uh, MCPD psychologists. So Dr. Davis and I have had conversations about how we can expand our reach and she's really working with Dr. Santiago to look at those clinicians that we have available and others that are in the county that we could use as part of a consortium so that we can have those, a pipeline of clinicians available as we build up our workforce. Yeah, um, you know, I'm just thinking about one of my favorite shows to watch um, when I have downtime, Billions, and they have a mental health counselor on site to ensure that all of the traders are up in tip-top shape when they are making those tough decisions. And the people who are going out into our community in some of the most dangerous, volatile situations with our most precious residents are babies. I want to make sure that they are in tip-top shape and making sure that they are mentally prepared for any situation that they walk into and are prepared to do 80 hours a week to protect our babies. We should be doing everything we can in the next budget season to give them what they need and to keep them in tip-top shape so they stay here. So I'm looking forward to seeing what innovative recommendations you have. And I don't know if um, we are hearing from you all about Montgomery College and the nursing program, or is it another panel? It's still no, in. that would, there. I see Montgomery College is here. I, I, do, <laughs> uh, I don't know if they want to make a quick comment. I do want to make sure you close us down here yeah. shortly. But that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Councilman ourselves also, yes. we talk about the available workforce um, and in Councilmember Jawando's um, querying of our public safety um, um, partners, the um, notion of America Corp came up. And so I uh, participated virtually on a session building an innovative, diverse, and effective uh, public health and human service workforce, and AmeriCorps mm -hmm. came up. The president mm -hmm. talked about not only looking at those, yeah. um, the younger generation, but also our senior generation who's yes, returning to the workforce. So we true. are looking strategically at those seniors who may be credentialed, <laughs> who may have certification to return to the workforce who may be looking for something else to do, mm -hmm. but could work in health and human services. So for all the seniors who are listening oh, yeah. to this <laughs> panel, yes. shameless plug, um, <laughs> we welcome you to support the efforts and needs of the Department of Health and Human Services. I love it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Quick quick comment on, <coughs> on the uh, nursing uh, program. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brad Stewart, and I'm the uh, Vice Pro, uh, President and Provost of the Tacoma Park Silver Spring Campus and Head of, uh, of the uh, Health Sciences Unit. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I'm filling in for Monique Davis, okay. who Monique and her uh, leadership team are at a national conference uh, on nursing education uh, mm. for this week. Um, but mental health concerns are woven into certain parts of the nursing curriculum. Oh, yeah. uh, it is possible for uh, people to not to specialize uh, in that at the associate degree level. Uh, that's what would happen once they transfer to a, a BSN program. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is something that um, our faculty are acutely aware of uh, while we're training uh, nurses, particularly in the course we have on uh, pr nurse professionalism. Uh, mm -hmm. I can get you the curriculum and the topics and for that if you uh, would so desire. Well, my, my question was more so focused on we have a decrease in recruitment of nurses. Mm -hmm. They're not applying. Yep. And I know that they are experiencing stressful experiences once they are on the job. And so what are we doing to alleviate those stressors once they leave the 
um, leave our education system and what are we also doing on the front end to ensure more people are being recruited into the profession and actually staying the course to enter the workforce. Yeah, I just uh, learned recently that um, across the state, um, nursing programs are experiencing a slight enrollment decline. Yeah. Uh, so we have work to do there. Yes. Uh, to yeah. attract them to uh, thing. I am pleased to announce that we just uh, released, uh, did a press release from the college uh, about a partnership with Adventist Hospital oh, uh, wow. that will involve, um, some of you may have received it uh, already, yeah. uh, about um, scholarships, uh, about internships, uh, about uh, mentorships uh, involving nurses at, um, at uh, Adventist Hospital uh, working with our students. Uh, as well, so I have great hopes for how that's going to work out. Uh, but that uh, we'll make sure that you all get uh, that press release. Yeah, we'd love to get uh, that to share. Uh, with them. I got it while we were sitting in the lobby waiting. Oh, uh, it just came out today. Okay. Yeah, it just came oh, out good. Today. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, and uh, and thank you again for waiting and for all the work that you're doing. Uh, and I know you were working while you were sitting here, so. <laughs> I saw that happening too. So uh, we uh, will be in touch and follow up on these items. MCPS, I just want to give you a shout out. I know you didn't actively participate, but you're embedded in all of this. Uh, we will be having a session on the workforce development programs in MCPS as well. It's a, you know probably after the holidays. So uh, just thank you for being great partners. Uh, with that, we are adjourned. Great is being held Saturday, November. 19, 2023, between 6 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Georgia Avenue will be closed between 6.30